My name is Ed Anderson. Uh, I'll be your facilitator for this. And on behalf of the Regional Business Alliance, I'd like to welcome you to this Fort Carson, Fort Carson listening session. Uh, to those of you who are here, but also to those who are in the overflow area, not just on the outside here, but of course we also have an overflow area in the Antlers, Antlers Hotel. Uh, it goes without saying that your presence here makes a major statement uh, of this state and the community's support for Fort Carson and just how much you do care for the community. So thank you very much for that. Just real quickly, I want to reiterate the reason we are here. Let me make it clear right from the very beginning. This is not a BRAC hearing. Uh, due to budget decisions, uh, the Army must reduce its end strength from 490,000 to 450,000. Uh, in order to do that, the Army staff is involved and engaged in developing courses of action for how that should be done. Uh, one of those courses of action is to reduce the force structure here at Fort Carson by 16,000, as you've seen before. Uh, but be aware that 29 other installations were given that same guidance, and these kinds of teams are going around to all 30 installations to listen to them. The leadership of the Army wanted to be sure that the community was heard from before they made a decision. And so that's the purpose of this listening session. I am going to deviate slightly from the agenda because uh, we do have uh, Governor Hickenlooper here. Uh, he made a special effort to be here today. He originally had a, a conflict. However, he told his staff that this was his priority and he wanted to be here, but he is going to have to leave very, very quickly. So it is my privilege and my pleasure to introduce our governor, Governor John Hickenlooper. Sir, welcome. That's, 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 what, that's after the election, just so we're clear. Um, thank you, General, for the introduction. I appreciate that and for, for all your help on this. Uh, and I won't take a lot of time. I often sometimes feel that being the governor is the toughest job. You, by the time the decision gets to me, it's usually there's not an easy decision or, or something that's going to really drive certain people nuts. I think sometimes I have the hardest job until I think about your job. And certainly being uh, running a BRAC process, and I've watched several, uh, you take all this information and you have uh, you know, you have to distill it down to what is most important and most relevant, and then you've got to make the best decisions you can. So uh, General Cloutier and uh, Colonel Councilman, General uh, La Camera, Colonel Hamilton, I get that. But I have my marching orders as well, and I've got to make two points uh, that I, I don't think I can make strong enough. One is that, you know, we do have a long, proud history with the military here in the Centennial State. Uh, and it has become just a, an organic part of this community, especially down in El Paso County in southern Colorado. There is as strong a, a connection to the community as I think you'll find anywhere in the country. Uh, you know, Fort Carson has just a, a lovely history uh, in terms of providing training that in, in many cases can't be gotten easily anywhere else. One of the things I often brag about, and I think this is what I would raise, you're going to hear a lot of people today talk about, you know, the, the impact on this community. So it's a $1.7 billion impact. There are bonds and relationships here that are beyond dollar recognition. Uh, but there is also, I think, things that we provide to the military that, that other communities, other locations can't. Uh, at least with the last time I talked to the to the Secretary of the Army, this was two and a half years ago, uh, but we had the highest reenlistment rate of, of any uh, Army base. We work very hard on making sure that our returning veterans get job training, that we get them employed, that that information gets back to the other active uh, personnel so that our identity, our brand here is a place where from the beginning forever we take care of, of the people that serve this country in uniform. Uh, we've had that, that attitude for many years, but we have really refined it in the last three or four years. And we continue to look at 
uh, and we try to be on the cutting edge. At every single place, we can help both the active duty military, but also the veterans when they come back, uh, and make sure that they get uh, from floor to ceiling total support. And I think that's part of why uh, you get the high reenlistment rates here. Now, it might have to do also with the 300 days of sunshine, the benign <laughs> weather that you're going to see here, the plentiful outdoor recreational opportunities, uh, but it is also this community in this state, and this, uh, I'm not just talking about this community, it's the entire state is 100% committed to uh, making sure that Fort Carson is absolutely the best base that it could, could possibly happen. Uh, we provide a high, high altitude uh, training opportunity for a number of different uh, brigades that really is probably, at least at this level, not replicable anywhere else. Uh, we hope that those, uh, those benefits, and, and not, not just the weather, the cost of living, the, all the intangibles, uh, can demonstrate that, and I'd be remiss in my duty if I didn't suggest that there probably will be opportunities that you consolidate. And I spent most of my life in the private sector, and, and there is a constant drumbeat of consolidation now in almost every enterprise. Generally, if done properly, that is an opportunity to improve efficiency, improve effectiveness. Uh, we want to be able to demonstrate to you that that consolidation not only should Fort Carson, Fort Carson not be diminished, but that might be an opportunity where you could get more benefit by having uh, even more uh, personnel here at the base. So I appreciate the difficulty of your challenge, uh, but over the next couple hours, you're going to hear a lot of testimony about how important it is for all of us that we keep uh, Fort Carson strong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. Uh, at this point, what I'd like to do is introduce you to the folks that you see up here on the dais. Uh, so I'd ask that we give a special Colorado welcome to our guests from the Pentagon. Uh, first is uh, Brigadier General Roger Cloutier. He is the Director of Force Management in G357 on the Army staff. Uh, he is no stranger to Colorado and no stranger to Fort Carson for that matter. He served at Fort Carson from 1999 to 2001 when he was the S3 of the 1st and the 8th Infantry and the 4th Infantry Division, and then subsequently was the S3 of the uh, 3rd Brigade Combat Team of the 4th Infantry Division. And incidentally, he told me that that was the best assignment he's ever had. <laughs> Uh, in addition to uh, General Cloutier, we also have Colonel Councilman here who, is work who works... Uh, on General Cloutier's staff as a division chief, and we also have Sergeant Major Norvell uh, back over here, who also is on General Cloutier's staff. <laughs> now, I just want you to know, we have an awful lot of distinguished guests here from across the state. And I, I think it would be informative for you because it really informs the importance of this effort as to uh, who, is, who those folks are. I'm not going to introduce them or have them stand up or anything. I'm going to say who they are in many cases, and in many cases just their position, but just to give you an idea. So, of course, you already know that Governor Hickenlooper was here. Lieutenant, Lieutenant Governor Joe Garcia is here. Uh, the TAG, the Adjutant General, Major General Mike Edwards is here. Colorado Secretary of State Wayne Williams is here. Colorado Aerospace and Defense Champion, uh, Major General Retired Jay Lindell. Uh, Senators Michael Bennett and Corey Gardner, you will see momentarily on a video. Uh, they would like to be here, and the same for Congressman Lamborn and Congressman uh, Tipton. Uh, former Senator Hank Brown is here. Uh, Colorado Economic Development Commission member Chuck Murphy is here. Director of the Colorado Office of Economic Development, Fiona Arnold, is here. Uh, staffs from Congressman Lamborn's office, uh, from Senator Bennett's office, from Senator Gardner's office are all here. I know uh, Mr. Bill Hibble was going to try to be here, President of El Pomar, he's here, and, and he is also a civilian aide to the Secretary of the Army. 
so he is here as well. We have uh, senior retired military folks here. General uh, Steve Lorenz is here, General Gene Renuard and his wife Jill, Lieutenant General Ed Soriano, Major General Bentley Rayburn, representing the many senior retired military that we have here in this community. We're very fortunate to have them. We have state legislators here, the President of the Colorado Senate, uh, a state representative, who, and some of these folks you will be hearing from during the presentations. Uh, we have six mayors here from across the region and a former mayor, Lionel Rivera. Uh, we have Kennett County Commissioners, the Chairman Dennis Heise, as well as others, uh, other members of the commission. We have uh, the Colorado Springs City Council with, headed by the President Keith King and other members. Uh, we have representatives here from Pueblo to include uh, a county commissioner, Sal Pace, and the vice president of the Pueblo City Council, Ed Brown, and members of the Chamber of Commerce. All of those people, I would point out to you, are elected officials. And I would just remind you that elected officials basically <coughs> represent the majority of the population in Colorado. So they will be speaking for the majority. Uh, in addition to that, we have representatives of higher education here, Chancellor Shockley from UCCS, uh, representatives of Colorado Want You, Mr. Joe Blake, as well as Major General Andy Love, Colorado Springs Regional Business Alliance to include the uh, chair, Debbie Chandler, a number of military-related support organizations that are here, other community partners that are here, Christian Anschutz was going to try to make it from the Anschutz Foundation, but we've got the Convention and Visitors Bureau CEO, uh, the Colorado Springs CEO, Mount Carmel Center, District 8 School Superintendent, Aurora Chamber of Commerce, Karen Share CEO, Pikes Peak Workforce Center CEO, United Way of Pikes Peak, or United Way of Pikes Peak Region CEO, the uh, Chairman of the Board of Memorial Hospital, uh, CEO of Discover Goodwill, that just gives you an idea of how important this issue is and they have chosen to be here. So that's a very significant representation as you can see. You see the agenda before you, um, that's uh, believe me very, very ambitious. Our intent is to try to have, our goal is to try to have this concluded by six o'clock you will note that there is an open session at the end of the presentations for you uh, to make any comments that you would like to make. I will also point out to you that there are comment sheets that were available at the door where you came in if you'd like to write down comments or you can use social media. Don't ask me how, I don't have a clue, but <laughs> probably most of, you, most of you folks probably do, but uh, nonetheless. So that's the, that's the uh, agenda. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and I do want to make sure to say thank you to the Antlers Hotel and to PSAV, who is the audiovisual group that supports the Antlers, uh, for providing the overflow area over there. And hopefully, you all can hear us over there. And if you can, give us a big yell. Well, I didn't hear it. <laughs> oh well. Okay. Let me just talk, let me just try to put uh, th some things here into context for our visitors. These are the major installations that are, exist here in the state of Colorado. And so as you can see, you see Buckley Air Force Base and there are about 6,400 folks up there. You see Pueblo Chemical Depot down to the south there. There's a small active duty detachment there that's overseeing the development of the capability to destroy chemical munitions. Pinion Canyon, of course, is represented there, not shown on here, but very, very important is a high-altitude uh, high aviation training facility out at Eagle. Um, and uh, so th that's a state perspective. If you go to the next slide, please, this will give you an idea. Next slide. This will give you an idea of what's here in the Pikes Peak region. And so if you start with the Air Force Academy, you're talking about 6,400 plus folks. Peterson Air Force Base, home of Air Force Space Command, of NORAD, NORTHCOM, uh, Space and Missile Defense Command, SMDC, 21st Space Wing, about 4,000 folks there. Uh, at Schriever, you have the 50th Space Wing. Those are the folks who fly the satellites that are up there. Uh, you also have the Missile Defense Integration and Operations Center, a subset or a sub-element of the Missile Defense Agency. You have the 100th GMD Brigade, the ones who are the trigger pullers 
for the nation's defense against intercontinental ballistic missiles, about 8,200 folks up there. And of course, you have about, you have over 26,000 folks here at Fort Carson. And that's only the, the military population. That does not represent the families. And if you were to add all of that up, you would get well, and to include families, you would get well over 100,000. So we'd offer to you that this community here is unique. There's probably no other community anywhere where you have this density of military population. So clearly, hopefully, you understand the context of what we, why you see this group here because the military clearly is integrated into this community very, very deeply and is a key element of, of everything that we do. Okay, uh, you've already heard from Governor Hickenlooper, so what I'd like to do at this point is turn the mic over to uh, Major General Paul LaCamera, CG of tw 4th Infantry Division. Uh, thank you, sir, and I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time out of their busy schedule to be here and for the governor taking his time to be here. I'd also like to thank El Paso County for the great support for allowing us to use this facility and um, everyone else that uh, be acting behind the scenes. As stated, the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army have sent members of our Army staff to hear directly from you because your input is important. This is a community's opportunity to have a voice is heard on Fort Carson's impact on all aspects of life in Colorado. We are truly in the listening mode tonight. We will capture your comments and share them with our Army leadership. This kind of session tonight is occurring on 30 installations across the United States, not just at Fort Carson. We're number 14, there's 16 to go. Soldiers fight to be stationed here at Fort Carson because they know what a great place this is for them and their families. And I'd like to turn it over to General Cloutier. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I'm Roger Cloutier. I'm the guy from Washington, D.C. Uh, and on behalf of uh, the Secretary of the Army and the Chief Staff of the Army, thank you so much uh, for hosting us. Um, your voices are important. Uh, the Pentagon is a long way from Colorado Springs. And we've got the facts in the building, and we understand square footage and training ranges and, you know, acreage. What we need to hear is the Fort Carson story, and we need to understand uh, the bond that the community has with Fort Carson. So your, your voices are very, very important, uh, and we are here to listen. Uh, so the Army's facing uh, a tough task. Sequestration is the law of the land, and uh, we as Army folks have to plan to execute that. If full sequestration is realized, we'll have to take 125,000 soldiers out of the total Army, that's all three compos, active component, National Guard and Army Reserve, and up to 26,000 Department of the Army civilians. Uh, so this is part of that effort and part of that planning process. It's not a requirement under the programmatic environmental assessment, but it is so important, important that the Secretary and the Chief asked us to go to all 30 installations and hear from you and bring back those stories uh, to the senior leaders uh, so they can make those decisions. I can tell you right up front, um, I briefed the Chief regularly and not a single decision has been made. So what happens here tonight is important. It will be part of several processes that are ongoing to evaluate um, end strength at different installations, doing some military value analysis, the listening sessions, the results of the supplemental programmatic environmental assessment will all be collated, uh, presented to the senior leaders uh, late spring, early summer, and then we can expect uh, some decisions. Uh, so that's kind of where we are uh, with respect to timing. So again, thank you for hosting us. Uh, we're really anxious to hear your story, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Colonel Carl Konzelman, and he's going to pitch a couple slides to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. How is that? Better? Our distinguished guests, community leaders, soldiers, civilians, and citizens of the Fort Carson community, good afternoon. My name is Colonel Carl Konzelman. I'm General Cloutier's FMO Division Chief. I have just a couple slides that I want to talk to you about this afternoon to sort of get you thinking about what's happening in the Department of the Army and how it can sort of bleed through all of our installations here in the United States. So the first slide that we have up here is just why the, why the Army is here and what our process is. We want to explain that to you. Transparency is our key through all of that, that we need to do. 
We are partners with the community, and we owe nothing less to you. And that's our promise from General Cloutier and from the senior leaders as well as we move through this whole process. Within that, we want to hear what you have to say. That's why we're here. It is truly a listening session. And, you know, General Cloutier mentioned, and I will just reinforce, that the senior leaders take this very seriously. That's why they've sent us out to hear your story, to take that back, so we can put it into a report that they will see within the next couple days, and it will be put in a binder for their, our official file when the decisions are made in late spring or early June. Now, the next slide is just a very simple agenda about some things we're going to talk about. First, we'll talk a little bit about what the Army has already done. Then we'll talk about what the Army plans on doing in the future and what the process is. We'll talk about the SPEA that General Cloutier mentioned just a moment ago. Then we'll show you a nice timeline of how everything works out and where we are right now before finally talking a little bit about what the senior leaders use to make those decisions. Now, General Cloutier will be bringing all of this information up to our senior leaders in the early spring time frame, and it will be an iterative process. And as he mentioned, in late spring or early summer, we'll have a decision. Now, as we go into the next slide, the first bullet is, is really what I want to direct your attention in first. And that is that on June 25th, the, the Chief of Staff of the Army stood up in the Pentagon briefing room, and he announced what was really the largest Army reorganization and restructure since World War II. Within that included the Army's active component going from 570,000 soldiers down to 490. That was a 14% decrease that we are currently executing right now and will be done at the end of this fiscal year, FY15. Within that, we went from 45 BCTs down to 32 and we increased the maneuver battalions in those BCTs from two maneuver battalions to three maneuver battalions. And what that did, it allowed us to have more point at the spear, if you will, or tooth to tail, as we like to call it, so our formations would be more full for when they went into combat. Now, Fort Campbell did not lose any structure throughout that whole process. As a matter of fact, it grew somewhere upwards of 1,300 spaces over fiscal years 12, 13, 14, and 15. Most of the other installations did see a decrement in what they had on their installations. What's important with all that, though, is although we called it the BCT reorganization, it was really much more than that. There were 740 units that were impacted in that entire process. Now, that's 50.9% of our total active force were impacted by, in the units in F fiscal years 14 and 15, which we are still executing. Now, that whole plan was supposed to take us out through 17, but the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army, realizing that we may have had to go below 490, decided to accelerate that. So that's the turbulence that your AC force has been going through last fiscal year and currently right now. It will be done, as I mentioned, at the end of this fiscal year in case we have to go below 490. Now, it could have been a lot more complicated, that 14% decrease from 570 down to 490. If you look at that third bullet, you'll see a couple numbers in there. First of all, we had something called TESI. That was our temporary end strength increase, which was 22,000 soldiers. But they were unstationed, unstructured soldiers. That allowed for when the men and women in the uniform deployed overseas, the units were able to go at 102, 103% in case somebody twisted an ankle or had to go on emergency leave. It did not decrement the unit as it went to deploy. So that was 22,000 spaces right there. Then we had another 10,000 in wartime allowance, which is really sort of a Tessie by another name. So 32,000 soldiers before we touched a single unit here within the continental United States. Then we had another 11.3,000 that we took out of Europe. And then we have something called our TTHS. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that's our trainees, transients, holdies, and students. Now that holds about 13% of our force overall. So when we went from 570 down to 490, it decreased 7.3 thousand. So that was 50,000 soldiers, excuse me, 50,000 soldiers that we were able to get from 570 down to 490 before we touched any of the units within any of the installations. The BCT reorganization also harvested about another 16,000 soldiers. Now what happened there, and I'll just use Fort Bragg for an example, they had four BCTs. So we inactivated one of their BCTs. When we did that, 
about 2,490 soldiers never left the installation because they went over into the remaining BCTs to seed those 3rd Maneuver Battalions within the remaining BCTs. As we go below 490, we no longer have that luxury. It is units that are in existence right now, men and women that are serving in uniform. And that's the criticality that General Cloutier mentioned just a moment ago as we have to look at the process as we move forward. Now, as we go into this next slide, we'll talk just a little bit about what the Army is doing and why. So it looks like over the next 10 years, the Army's budget is going to decrease by about $95 billion. So with that is a personnel decrease, which could go from 490 down to 450 or as low as 420. So from 570 down to 490 was a 14% decrease. From 490 down to 450 will be a 21% decrease. And if we have to go all the way down to 420, that will be a 26% decrease in what our wartime high strength was of 570,000. So why do we have to take those soldiers out? There's only so many places that we can get money. And if it's not in soldiers, you'll notice that bullet up there that talks about the hollow army that some of you who maybe remember back in the 70s was such sort of a fashionable term. And that's what scares the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army terribly, that we're going to end up with a force that's not trained, equipped, <clears throat> or manned properly with all of the modernized equipment that it needs. And at the end of the day, that's the only other places that we can get our money from. So it would be soldiers that would not have the proper manning, not proper equipping, modernization, or training to go into combat with the formations that we have now to fight and win our nation's wars. So in the end, the $95 billion, it is what's driving a lot of these decisions as we look at this whole process. Now, General Cloutier did mention about what the numbers here at, 14 Camp, at uh, Fort Carson, what we did analyze, 16,000. That's 15,295 soldiers and 705 civilians. But that 16,000 is not what Fort Carson is projected to lose or what their actual losses are going to be. Rather, it provides the opportunity for General Cloutier to lay out a range of options for the senior leaders to be able to make their decisions as we move forward. And within that is the process that will drive us to the national needs and what's best strategically for our nation. Now, as we go into the next slide, which is going to talk a little bit about the SPEA, and I know that a lot of you have, have had some comments about that. We received 3,900 comments from Fort Carson alone. Of the 30 installations, we received 111,297. So we opened it up for a 60-day public comment period on the 25th of June. That closed on the 25th of August. And then we consolidate all of those comments, and it went into the SPEA. Now, the G3 of the United States Army, Lieutenant General Huggins, our boss, signed the FONSI, the finding of no significant impact, on 10 November of 2014. It went into the Federal Register on the 14th of November. Now, the finding of no significant impact stated that if Fort Carson or the other installations were to lose 16,000 or whatever the number was, there would, be no, there would be no environmental significant impacts. Of course, the social economic impacts are significant here, as well as 26 of the other, of the other 30 installations that we analyzed. And as the governor mentioned, it's over a billion dollars here to the Fort Carson area for the 16,000 that we looked at when we did the analysis. But again, that was just for the analysis. It's not what's projected to come out of Fort Carson or what's actually going to be lost. <coughs> General Cloutier and the team will wrap all that up with our options as we move forward and bring that up to the senior leaders sometime in the spring. So where are we right now? And I think the next slide shows it very well and what drives this whole train. So we're here at the listening sessions. You can see that very clearly on the top left. But what's driving all this, of course, is the strategic needs of the nation, the QDR, <clears throat> the strategic guidance that we get. All of that will be taken as we move forward. And you can see where the decision will be down there on the bottom left. And once again, we expect that sometime in the late spring or early summer. I often say that if we just use our most recent history as a guide, when the chief of staff stood up on the 25th of June, that was pretty early summer to say what was going to happen from 570 down to 490. So what does the Army use to make its decision? And on this final slide that we have here, you'll see up at the top we have something called the military value analysis. 
Now that is something that we use here at Fort Carson and all of the other BCT installations, but only the BCT installations. And the reason is because we can only compare like, like installations to like installations. We can't really compare Fort Carson to Fort Leonard Wood, Fort Leonard Wood to Fort Hood, so on and so on. But the BCT installations are all part of that mix. And we take a look at the training area, what type of railheads you have, deployability, infrastructure, and all of that goes into the military, military value analysis. It's run by the Center of Army Analysis, and they have a formula, and then it will let us know where the installations sort of stand out. But of course, there's other things up there. You'll notice the listening session is up there. But the strategic needs of the nation are up there as well. And that's something that's going to weigh heavily as the senior leaders weigh their options and their decisions to move forward if we have to go from 450 to 420. The last slide up here is just that we're going to be eagerly looking forward to your comments to be able to take them back to the Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army. It's an honor to be here with you tonight. And every time I stand in front of an audience, large or small, distinguished or not, I always like to say thank you. Thank you for your service. Thanks for what you do for your communities, our soldiers, and no matter what uniform the men and women of this great nation wear, thank you and we look forward to hearing from you tonight. Okay, thank you very much, Colonel Kunzelman, for that uh, briefing for us. Uh, what we'd like to do now, if you recall the agenda, we're going to move into the segment that we call the Colorado and Community Briefings, and we're going to begin it uh, with some comments and introductions of uh, some of our distinguished guests. Uh, first one up on, on tap will be the Adjutant General of Colorado, Major General Mike Edwards. Uh, he is going to speak, and uh, we've moved him up because he's got to run from here up to Denver, catch, a, catch the red eye to head back east, and so we want to make sure you make that plane, Mike, uh, and go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much, General Anderson and uh, General Cameron. It's great to see you again. Uh, General Cloutier, thank you so much for this opportunity, and Colonel Consulman, thank you for the slides to kind of cover this whole situation, and Colonel Hamilton, thank you. Um, you know, the emotional side of you, says we'll max that, the quantitative analysis. But uh, what, what I wanted to do is actually spend a little bit of time talking about the diversity of Fort Carson. Uh, one of the things that on the map when you showed the major installations, they were the major installations. What, what it didn't show are the more than 30 armories and readiness centers out there with guard and reserves in the amount of over 10,000 here in the state that absolutely utilize Fort Carson for much of their training and have a great partnership <laughs> with Fort Carson and 4ID. So I wanted to make sure that that was emphasized as a guard member. Um, my history with military installations here in Colorado goes back to the previous decade, previous century, uh, 1969, when I went to school just up north here at the United States Air Force Academy. And you go, why would that have an impact on an Air Force Academy cadet in 1969, 1970 time frame? Well, the Air Force Academy has had a long partnership with Fort Carson. We come to Fort Carson and we do training. And so I still remember as a cadet being bused to Fort Carson and having the opportunity to go through the combatives course, to go through and watch and learn how the Army operates because we needed to know that as cadets at the Air Force Academy and future officers of what this partnership means with our great land component members. So uh, it goes back a long ways. So that's a long time ago. In all these years, I've seen a lot of change, uh, especially here at Fort Carson. It's an amazing post, just an amazing post. And uh, General Cloutier, I'm sure you see it too uh, in the time that you've been away. It's just amazing. So what I really wanted to talk about a little bit is the synergies, the different organizations that actually count on Fort Carson as a home. Uh, the first one that I'll mention is the 13th ASOS. They're amazing. And with them here, it gives us a great opportunity on our Air National Guard side with the 140th Wing up at Buckley to exercise and to be able to train with those that we work with on the battlefield in most of the wars that we have been fighting over the last 20 years. And we have a range right here on the south end of Fort Carson called Airburst. It's a restricted airspace, R2601, owned by Fort Carson, but we utilize it as an Air National Guard and our ASOS uses it also. And that range is so uh, well thought of across the United States that we actually have units deployed to Buckley to fly out of Buckley to work with the ASOS 
to be able to utilize that range because of the high altitude capabilities and again, the ability to work with the ASOS. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, great asset. Um, with that discussion of the ASOS, uh, I need to bring into it being another thing that goes on with our National Guard, and that's a state partnership program and what Fort Carson means to that. Uh, we have had our Jordanian partners here at Fort Carson, uh, not just to learn about dropping bombs from the Air Force side, but also to work with the ASOS to learn how to be tactical controllers. We've had them here to basically train on HIMARS, and so it ties in very closely with what Fort Carson has, as 4ID has such a diverse force that we're able to work with here in Fort Carson. Uh, it was mentioned that we have the new cab here at Fort Carson, and part of the advantage is they get to train in high altitude environments. Well, in the National Guard, we actually have a facility up at Eagle, and General Anderson mentioned it. It's a high altitude aviation training site. And again, with the new cab here at Fort Carson, it gives us the great opportunity to partner and move further ahead to make this cab the most amazing cab that we have in the United States of America. Um, the other things that we have at Fort Carson that again show the great partnership between Paul and I, we have a regional training institute uh, that we actually developed as the first multi-compo warrior leader course here in Colorado. It's the first one in the nation. Uh, luckily, we got some military construction money while the money was still there, and so we have a new RTI that's actually being built on the kind of the middle part of Fort Carson where we look forward to even more opportunities to share and work together with our active duty brethren, our Army National Guard, and our reserves as we move ahead. So when you think about Fort Carson, and the governor mentioned the 300 days of sunshine, what I see is the four seasons and the ability to train in just about any type of condition that you can train in here in Colorado at Fort Carson, whether it be high altitude, whether it be the heat of summer in a semi-arid slash desert type climate, it's an amazing post that provides great opportunity for our great United States to, to no kidding train here in Colorado. It also serves as a regional facility, not just for our guard and reserve here in Colorado, but for the states around. Uh, when you look at Utah, South Dakota, Wyoming, we share Fort Carson and they end up showing up here and we actually have a, there's an exercise called Golden Coyote that runs out of South Dakota in most cases, but it's looking at expanding here to Fort Carson so we have a synergy between the active component and our Guard and Reserve component as we exercise here in the middle of the United States. So there's just great synergy with this great post here at Fort Carson to be the national treasure that it is to our great United States. The bottom line to me is the 4ID and other units here at Fort Carson, they do, they have, a, they have the ability to train to a wide array of conditions, environment, you name it. Fort Carson's an amazing place. So as you look at Fort Carson, I would ask that you really take time to assess the synergies of the organizations that Fort Carson support besides 4ID, because 4ID is partnered with many of them and serve as a great training and mentor for our Guard and Reserve. So it's much appreciated. And with that, I really do thank you for moving me up and having the opportunity to discuss these great opportunities for Fort Carson. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much, General Edwards. Hope you have a safe trip. Uh, next up will be uh, two videos uh, by our congressional delegations. Uh, they regret they couldn't be here, I guarantee you. They wish they were here rather than back there. Uh, but as you know, Congress is in session and they are doing the, the nation's work, so they had to stay there. But they wanted to be sure that this team had their views and took them into consideration as they went through their process. So if we could have the first video, please, with uh, Senators Bennett and Gardner. Hi, I'm Michael Bennett. I'm Senator Cory Gardner. We're sorry that we can't be with you to express support for our Fort Carson soldiers and their families and to thank them for their service to our country. Unfortunately, we're stuck in Washington. We'd like to thank the Army commanders in attendance today. They recognize the value of creating strong partnerships with Colorado and our local communities. Their efforts to address concerns related to Pinion Canyon are an example of the success of these relationships. 
We've seen a number of programs developed at Fort Carson turn into Army-wide models for collaboration. Those models include consulting with tribal experts about protecting historic sites, environmental stewardship programs on training lands, and conservation agreements through the ACUB buffer program. We also want to thank the local governments that have worked with Fort Carson. These Colorado communities support our soldiers and their families by fostering an innovative, growing economy, building a world-class education system, and having the best quality of life of any place in the country. It's Fort Carson's mission to provide the best training for our soldiers and airmen. Whether it's at Pinion Canyon, Fort Carson, Hats, or other federal lands that provide unique opportunities only Colorado can offer. We support that mission, and we are committed to maintaining our strong partnership well into the future. Thank you to the Army commanders in attendance today, and thank you to the thousands of men and women at Fort Carson for your service to our country, and thank you for the opportunity to be with Senator Bennett today as we express our support for Fort, for Fort Carson. When I think of Fort Carson, I think of not only the thousands of men and women who are serving our country and keeping us safe, but the husbands and wives that are instrumental in helping our schools and communities become better places to live, and your children who provide such a positive future for this area and the state of Colorado. Colorado provides Fort Carson with the assets that are necessary for troops to prepare. For example, the current Pinion Canyon site provides a unique field-like training ground, which is essential for troop readiness. Just as Colorado is an asset to Fort Carson, Fort Carson is an asset to the surrounding communities. This strong partnership between the Army and Colorado helps provide a better quality of life for our servicemen and women while being an engine that helps our communities grow. I'm proud of what we have already accomplished together, and I look forward to future successes between Fort Carson, Colorado, and local communities. Fort Carson is more than a military institution. Fort Carson makes our communities whole, and as such, I will work to ensure that any future rounds of budget cuts, sequestration, don't impact the work that we are doing in Colorado Springs. We support Fort Carson's critical mission and the vital role it plays in our national security. We support keeping Fort Carson strong, and we support the continued partnership between our communities and Fort Carson. Okay, and the next video will be from Congressman Lamborn and Tipton. Good evening. I'm Congressman Doug Lamborn. And I'm Congressman Scott Tipton. Thank you so much for coming to Centennial Hall to show your support for Fort Carson. Since its beginnings over 72 years ago, Fort Carson has been a vital part of our community and an essential part of our national defense. Today, this world-class facility houses over 26,000 active duty soldiers whose presence generates an economic impact of over $2 billion. That impact positively affects our entire state, including the 3rd Congressional District. Fort Carson is a unique installation that, ha that has the size, terrain, and community support necessary to train our soldiers to meet the threats facing our nation in a dangerous world. That's why during his visit I hosted last year, House Armed Services Committee Chairman Mac Thornberry described our region as the future of warfare. The level of community support and the breathtaking natural beauty have made Fort Carson one of the top two most popular duty stations in the entire Army. Soldiers want to serve here because they've heard about the type of support that you'll see here tonight. And they want to serve here because they want to be on the cutting edge of the latest military technology and operations. The 10th Special Forces Group, a brand new Combat Aviation Brigade, a Striker Brigade, a world-class infantry division, the most authentic possible training, studying natural beauty and outdoor opportunities, and a community that admires and supports their sacrifices. Fort Carson is a top-notch facility in the best region in America. Please join us and do your part to keep Carson strong and support our military. Okay, thank you very much to uh, the congressional presentations. Sorry you can't be here. Uh, next, we are pleased to have uh, with us tonight uh, a newly elected state representative, uh, Terry Carver from House District 20. Terry, welcome. Thank you, sir. Uh, gentlemen, uh, thanks for uh, coming to Colorado Springs, El Paso County, state of Colorado. Uh, I am here. Uh, to send a strong message that Colorado is united in our support of Fort Carson and its ongoing mission. Uh, just last Friday, as part of Military Appreciation Day, 
the Colorado State Legislature passed a joint resolution, uh, which I would like to read uh, the, the pertinent part. Be it resolved by the House of Representatives of the Seventh General Assembly of the State of Colorado, the Senate concurring herein, that we express our continued reliance upon and support of Fort Carson and maintain our strong commitment to supporting ongoing military training at this mountain post. Um, as a retired Air Force officer, uh, I was stationed along with my husband, who's also retired Air Force, at many different military installations. And many of them uh, very strong pro-military in their values and their support. But I have to say uh, that I have never seen a network of uh, organizations such as I have seen in Colorado in support of our veterans and total force. We have over 50 veterans organizations and over 60 associate service provider organizations providing a full range of support for our veterans, active duty, guard, reserve, and those who have left uh, service. In addition, uh, we have uh, several state level funds that Colorado has uh, provided funding specifically to help our veterans, including active duty. Our Veterans Trust Fund that just last year provided over 800,000 in grants in support of our veterans. Uh, just locally, over 1.3 million uh, given in, from various nonprofits in support of veterans, including active duty and their families. And finally, I am proud to say that just this morning, the uh, Colorado House, uh, during what we call second reading, uh, gave unanimous support to expanding our State Military Relief Family Act, which provides support to veterans and their families who have deployed in service to our country. Uh, so I can tell you uh, that uh, Democrat and Republican, we are united in the state legislature in support of Fort Carson, both continuing current mission and hopefully adding some mission. I would also uh, like to pass on to you uh, State Representative Lois Landgraf, who represents the community of Fountain, uh, which has a symbiotic relationship with Fort Carson. Uh, deeply regretted she was not able to be here. She actually has six bills before committees today, so she is running frantically from room to room, but asked me to read a statement on her behalf. Fort Carson is not only an invaluable contributor to the Colorado Springs area, but has become part of our state's identity and its impact cannot be overstated. Fort Carson is as much a part of Colorado Springs area as any school or business. And I strongly urge this commission to consider this whole community when calculating any reductions. Finally, what may not be measured is the leadership and inspiration the service members of Fort Carson bring to our community. Their presence helps inspire all of us, and their emotional contribution certainly equals the economic benefits to this area and the state of Colorado. And as I was uh, leaving the House floor and passing numerous members, both Democrat and Republican, I said, what final message would you like me to pass on uh, to the Pentagon officials visiting? And they said, uh, keep Carson strong. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Representative Carver. Appreciate it. Next up, we have uh, mayors from a number of the communities here in the area, uh, and some of them will speak. And with, so I would ask all of these mayors that you see uh, on the list here if they could just come up and stand behind uh, Mayor Bockel, start the, start the conversation, please, and if the other mayors could be come up.
Thank you, General. Gentlemen, welcome to the proud home of Fort Carson and the 4th Infantry Division. I'm with my fellow mayors for our region here today to show you our deep support for Fort Carson. And in addition to that, we're proud to have the mayor of Trinidad, which is adjacent to Pinion Canyon, Mayor Riorta, who, by the way, needs to leave to get back for a city council meeting in Trinidad, which is at least a two and a half hour drive. Really appreciate you, Mayor, coming up here today. <laughs> Gentlemen, you know, um, this city is uh, famous for uh, Army people. In fact, uh, I'm a proud veteran of the United States Army myself, having served in the 5th Infantry Division Artillery in the 1960s. And as you heard earlier, our previous mayor, Lionel Rivera, is here tonight. He served with the 4th Infantry Division. And I would tell you that you will find Army veterans as well as active duty personnel throughout this region in leadership positions. We're very proud of that. And uh, I also want to tell you a little bit about our history with the United States Army. Our love affair with the United States Army goes back 142 years. That is when this city was founded, Colorado Springs, by William Jackson Palmer. He was from Pennsylvania. He enlisted in the Union Army during the Civil War to turn back slavery. And after the war, he retired at the ripe old age of 29 as a Brigadier General. And in fact, he was one of our early Congressional Medal of Honor winners. And he went back in the railroad business for a company working its way west, Transcontinental Railroad. And when he got to Denver, he decided he wanted to start a new railroad, uh, the Denver and Rio Grande, to build a railroad from Denver to the Mexico border. This was his first stop. And he thought, what a wonderful place, what a wonderful place to start a town. So I honestly think it's in our DNA, the love and respect we have, certainly for all the free world military, and especially the United States Army in our region. Later on, in 1942, after Pearl Harbor, this city purchased the land just south of our border and gave it to the War Department for Camp Carson, continuing our tradition of our partnership and respect and love for the United States Army. I will tell you that we are a unified community. I've been lots of places around this country in my travels. And if you spend time here, you'll see that we are one family. There isn't a separation between the civilian in the military ranks. We're one family here, and we care about each other both ways. And I will tell you that we have Fort Carson soldiers volunteering in our schools, our religious institutions, nonprofits all across this community. And we also have a, a large number of nonprofits, as has already been said, dedicated to helping Army soldiers and their families. I want to talk to you for a second about recreational marijuana. As you probably know, the state of Colorado voters a couple years ago voted to approve recreational use of um, marijuana. That law contains a provision allowing municipalities to opt out of commercial sales. And I'm proud to tell you that Colorado Springs opted out of allowing commercial sales of recreational marijuana. And most of our neighbors did the same, in part out of respect for the military, Fort Carson, and an appreciation for Fort Carson's aggressive drug program. And I will finally tell you that Colorado Springs the Police Department among other law enforcement agencies here, fully enforces the DUI laws as relates certainly to marijuana. As has already been said, Fort Carson is a choice assignment. I remember when I came here a lifetime ago how thrilled I was to be able to be in this part of the world. And enables, I believe, the Army to retain the best soldiers. And, and the reason is it's so special, as you've heard, the training value, the quality of life, and the great support from this community. We are one here. We have each other's back. Thank you for being here today and for allowing us to tell you about our broad, deep support for the United States Army and Fort Carson. Thank you, sir. Thank you for coming and listening to all of the area mayors. Um, I think. Uh, I have the solution to the problem. It's all about money. <laughs> and I'm a 41-year retiree from education, and I taught United States history. And coming up, I thought there's a solution to this problem. We have 400 United States representatives. Cut it to 200. <laughs> Huh? 
100 Democrats and 100 Republicans. <laughs> Cut the Senate to 50. 25 Democrats, 25 Republicans. We can support the military for the rest of our lives. <laughs> we have a unique situation in Trinidad that we're fortunate enough to have Pino Canyon. I was the chairman of the Democratic Committee when we first flew over that in, in a, a helicopter. And we talk about uh, the quality of the land. If you saw the quality of the land then and the quality of the land now, you wouldn't believe it was the same property. The environmentalists are continually pressing people to do this and do that. And I've served in the National Guard for 10 years. And I served, I attended, I was fortunate enough to be at four different campsites. And the ecology was magnificent. Then, that was in the 50s, it's more magnificent now. Attending the meetings that Colonel Hamilton has monthly, I've learned from the ecologists that we have a Mexican jumping mouse. <laughs> and I said to them, I don't think that a military member of the tank battalion would be worried about whether he was going to run over a mouse or not or he was going to protect his life and the United States of America. We, I'm not here to talk about the economic impact on the city of Trinidad. I'm here to talk about the necessity of the greatest military unit in the world staying right where it is, not reducing it, increase it. We have the world looking at us to decide whether we're going to be strong or weak. And right now we have the strongest, best equipped military force in the, in the world. Let's keep it that way. Uh, I like to pride myself on saying that I'm the mayor of Trinidad and uh, the mayor of Los Animas County. I believe the uh, county commissioner uh, is here today on behalf of the county. But in my platform, when I ran for mayor, I said I have one platform. Let's work together. It's so easy. I told my wife, it's hard enough to be married when you get along. It's very difficult when you don't get along, so let's get along. <laughs> so with that, the, the state of Colorado supports the military. Thank you for coming. God bless you, and God bless America. Okay, I, I, I think we're going to uh, start a campaign of uh, Mayor Riorta for president. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Ortega, please, thank you. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for coming out to uh, Colorado. Um, it's, it's great to hear, I grew up here, I'm born and raised in Fountain, and uh, to hear all the wonderful things about Fountain is just, uh, or about Colorado, is, uh, which is pure Pure Colorado, actually. Um, uh, it's, it's just a great thing. Um, on behalf of the city of Fountain, I would like to thank you for making Fort Carson your home. We view ourselves largely as an army town and feel a great deal of affinity for the hometown heroes that come here from all over the United States. Fort Carson is the best hometown army. And that is largely because of the communities that surround it. We have made huge investments into infrastructure, 
systems, and processes to support the men and women and their families who serve our nation. I will not reiterate other comments that have been shared, and you'll, you'll hear a lot of them tonight. But I do want to touch briefly on the Army Community Covenant that the City of Fountain and Colorado Springs both entered, to, entered into with the Army several years ago. A covenant is something more than just an agreement or a commitment. It is a sacred acknowledgement that we are working together for a common cause. Our covenant, in part, states, together, we are committed to building strong communities. It then goes on to say, we, the community, recognize the commitment soldiers and their families are making every day. The strength of soldiers comes from the strength of their families. The strength of the families is supported by the strength of the community. And the strength of the community comes from the support of employers, educators, civic and business leaders, and of course its citizens. We the community are committed to building partnerships that support the strength, resilience, and readiness of soldiers and their families. For Fountain, this Army Community Covenant symbolizes our community's commitment to our armed men and women and the family members that they leave behind. We want our soldiers and their families to know that we recognize that behind every good soldier is a strong family, and behind every strong family is a strong community that, their sacrifice, rec that recognizes their sacrifice is committed to the supporting them in any way we can. Fountain is one of those strong communities as we sincerely hope that the Army recognizes what it means to its overarching mission to protect our country. We as a community in the city of Fountain take pride in ensuring we can support our military families when one of theirs is deployed. We appreciate everything that's, that Fort Carson has done for the city of Fountain, and we try as hard as we can to make sure we provide everything we can for not only the soldiers but their families who choose to live in Fountain. We have a number of retirees who choose to come back and make Fountain their forever home. Um, along with the Colorado Springs area, we find our relationship to be totally symbiotic. So on behalf of the City Council of City Fountain and, and the rest of the staff and, and the citizens there, we appreciate you and thank you for coming. Thank you for your service to our country. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, at this point, we'd like to uh, have Sal Pace and Ed Brown come forward. Uh, our great friends and partners from the South in Pueblo. So please welcome Sal Pace and Ed Brown. I'm Sal Pace, uh, County Commissioner in Pueblo County. This is Ed Brown, uh, City Councilor from, what I say? No, 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 no. It's, it's up there. Okay, I thought I said the wrong county. No, that would no. have been embarrassing. <laughs> uh, Pueblo County Commissioner and Ed Brown, uh, City Councilor from uh, Pueblo. Uh, we have a lot of Puebloans in the room, and uh, if there's any doubt, uh, I'd like to uh, clearly state that Pueblo County and the city of Pueblo loves our army. Pueblo is proud to have the congressional delegation as being the home of heroes, and we earn that by having more Medal of Honor recipients than any other community in the entire United States. And it was Eisenhower who said, what is it in the water out there in Pueblo? All you guys turn out to be heroes, as he was awarding another Puebloan uh, a Medal of Honor. And of course, uh, the economic impact of Fort Carson is critically important not only to El Paso County and Colorado Springs, but also to those of us uh, in Pueblo as well. Um, I think it's important to uh, bring up the Pinion Canyon expansion uh, and uh, the concerns that existed 10 years ago, um, representing southeastern Colorado, I opposed the expansion or the, uh, what was thought to be an expansion. Um, the Army now makes it clear that they didn't intend to expand. Uh, but first of all, myself and also my constituents in Pueblo County and southeastern Colorado always supported the Army and always supported Fort Carson. Secondly, this is in the past. The Army earned a lot of respect and a lot of kudos uh, for the waiver, for uh, releasing the waiver, for the outreach. I want to give uh, a lot of credit to uh, Garrison Commander Bob McLaughlin for uh, spending a lot of time in southeastern Colorado, proving that the Army is good stewards of the land, of the environment, of the history and the culture of southeastern Colorado, and that 
Pinion Canyon is important to the mission of Fort Carson and to the Army. We in Pueblo continue to so support the Army and continue to support Fort Carson. We know that the communities in southeastern Colorado, the communities across Colorado, support Fort Carson. We know that the troops support Fort Carson. And we know that the Army supports Fort Carson. And as a side note, I want to take a moment to address the audience because those of you up here can't lobby Congress, but we can. And I think Mayor Riorta touched on a key point. The federal government has to get their act in order. And the only reason we're here today, and you're traveling around to 30 installations, which you deserve the credit for listening to the communities, is because our federal government has not gotten their act in order. Sequestration is not the answer to solving our nation's problems. And what we really need is leadership. And it's on all of our shoulders to lobby members of Congress to ensure that we have leadership so that you guys aren't put in the tough decision of cutting troops away from an important installation no matter where it is in this United States. And it's my honor to introduce Ed Brown, City Councilor from Pueblo. I just want to briefly say that uh, I, my history with uh, Fort Carson goes back to when it was Camp Carson when I was a kid. And um, I come from a military family. And uh, in, in the areas I served uh, in, the, in my three years in the Army, uh, I didn't get to serve at Fort Carson, but uh, I would like to because of the I think of the community and the climate, I think we, uh, someone else mentioned we have all uh, four elements of the seasons and it's a good place to train. It's a great place to live and um, sorry I didn't get to, uh, wasn't stationed here when I was, when I was in the service. Uh, I, I just think that the, you know, the, because of the area the, and the support of the community that uh, and Pueblo being the home of heroes, that we, we support the military a lot. And that, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we'd like to invite the, the folks from Aurora to come forward, please. Hi, Kevin. Thank you, General, General Anderson. Thank you for being here. And welcome to Colorado. Uh, hopefully, you spend a little money here, too. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, Kevin Hogan. I'm the president of the Aurora Chamber, along with our senior vice president, Rini Samard, former chief at Buckley Air Force Base, and Lisa Buckley, the chair of our Defense Council. Uh, really is an honor to be here. Um, we represent up in the Denver Aurora Boulder area almost three million people. And I know talking to my counterparts in Boulder and in uh, Denver, uh, Kelly Abroff, uh, that we are all here to support what goes on here at Fort Carson. Uh, the former president of the Denver Chamber, longtime great gentleman Joe Blake is here right behind us uh, also. <clears throat> we want to thank you again for visiting us and we want to talk a little bit about the elements that we feel are so important. Buckley, as you heard from General Edwards, really relies on Fort Carson and the ability to partner with all of our military. Due to the state of Colorado's unique geography, our climate, our highly skilled workforce, uh, this is a very affordable place to live, to raise your family, and then hopefully retire. Fort Carson brings a wide array of military missions, uh, from the classroom to the high altitude range military training in the straight state. We thrive on military training in Colorado, and Fort Carson plays a major role in our national security. With the 4th Infantry, Infantry Division training and deployments, Fort Carson is not only a state treasure, but it is a national treasure. And I'm here to support, along with 3 million people in the Denver, Boulder, Aurora area, uh, our support for Fort Carson, what it brings to our state, what it brings to our, our country, and really to the worldwide protection that we all do. So I want to thank you for being here, but I want to really represent, again, a large part of our state that relies on Fort Carson. Uh, we are just so proud to have Fort Carson in our background, 
and in our in our uh, in our whole Front Range area. Uh, the entire state again relies on Fort Carson, and we want to uh, add that support from the Aurora area, from Buckley Air Force Base, and over 90,000 people retired in the Denver Aurora area. We count on Fort Carson for that support uh, and that uh, benefit. So thank you for being here. And uh, General Anderson, thank you for the opportunity to say a few words from the Denver Aurora Boulder area. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for your support. Uh, before we get into the, uh, the next piece here, I need to make a correction. I made a couple of mistakes here. One of the people I failed to introduce who is a part of the team here but isn't up here on the stage, but nonetheless plays a very important role is Mr. Andy Napoli, who is from the Office of the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Installation, Housing, and Partnership. Welcome, Andy, and I apologize for not recognizing you. And then the other one who's seated right to my right, I mean, is Colonel Joel Hamilton, who most of you already know, who is the garrison commander out at Fort Carson. And so he is up here along with his boss, uh, General LaCamera. Okay, let me move now into the economic impact, and uh, Andy Merritt from the Regional Business Alliance will make that presentation. General LaCamera, General Cloutier, Colonels Consulman and Hamilton, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you all today. And I'm just going to touch real briefly on the economic impact of, uh, of the, the cuts that you're considering currently. Um, the state of Colorado has a tremendous, as you've seen by the map, has a tremendous amount of DOD presence in the state, not just amongst active duty, but amongst contractors and, and the like, to the tune of what we're hearing right now in excess of probably $20 billion of economic impact that the Department of Defense brings to our state. So what you're seeing here today from the people coming up in front of you is this is way more than just about our community in Colorado Springs and Fountain and Pueblo. This is about the whole region and about the whole state. Uh, if you look at the numbers that we have, $2.17 billion. That's the direct economic impact from Fort Carson that it has. These are fiscal 2013, fiscal year 2013 numbers. $2.17 billion. Significant. 15%. 15% of all the wage income in El Paso County is a result of the presence of Fort Carson here in our region. So it means a lot to us. It's a significant a part of our economy. What would the cuts mean that you all are considering? I encourage you to just take a look at a couple statistics. I put the economic impacts at some different size cuts, 3,500, 8,000, and 16,000 for you. Um, just to give you an idea, 16,000 was mentioned earlier. It's $1.07 billion that comes out of our economy here locally, a roughly $27 billion economy, so dramatic. The sales tax implications, and why did I put sales tax up there? Because so many of our local governments are uh, predominantly funded through sales tax. It's a v major part of their budget. If you look at Colorado Springs, even at the lowercase scenario, $892,000 in lost sales tax. But look at Fountain, $147,000 in lost sales tax. A much smaller community than Colorado Springs, much more dependent upon the presence of Fort Carson to meet its budget needs, to be able to provide services to its citizens. At the worst case scenario, Fountain would lose $672,000 out of their budget, and Colorado Springs would lose $4.08 million. The last line I'm going to highlight for you, and then we'll move on, residents. Look at the number of people that your decision would make. If you took 16,000 people out, that's 36,656 people who leave our community. And I want you to think about two things relating to that. Those are people that, as you've, was mentioned earlier, are integral to our community. They volunteer, both the, the active duty members and their families. They volunteer in our community, all across the community in myriad of ways, helping serve other people in the community, not just looking to be served themselves. And it's also people that when you take these people out of our community, it, it tears at the fabric of our community, as, as Mayor Bach was talking about, because this has been an integral part of us from the very beginning. So this is, means a great deal to us. Uh, having these people leave would be dramatic. But I also want you to think having these people leave would be dramatic for you. When I was a young lieutenant, after doing two winters in Korea, I got assigned to come back to Fort Carson. And let me tell you, it felt like a reward. I was thrilled to be coming back to Fort Carson. I had never been out here, never visited here, watched quite a few football games where it seemed to snow every football game, but it still seemed like a reward. And once I got here, it absolutely was a reward. All those people you're going to take that you potentially could take out of Fort Carson, they're in the same boat. They want to come here. 
As was mentioned by the governor, this is one of the most sought after assignments in the Army. It is a reward. And I can tell you, no offense to other installations, but not every installation would be looked at as a reward for an assignment. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're going to move, we're going to take a slightly different focus now. We're going to shift our focus a little bit. Uh, one of the things we are very proud of here in the state and in our communities is that we really recognize and appreciate the sacrifices that are made by the service members and their families out there at Fort Carson. And what we tried to do is we tried to express that appreciation by being committed to providing resources and support to add value to Fort Carson and its mission and quality of life to their soldiers and family members. We are committed to keeping Carson strong. So we'd like to tell you about some of those initiatives that we've done. There's no way that we can tell you about everything. We would be here all night. So we have uh, picked a few, and we'll begin by uh, Secretary of State Wayne Williams, uh, who will talk uh, to you about some of the transportation enhancements. Secretary Williams, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate your being here and listening to our community. You heard Governor Hickenlooper describe our state's 100 percent commitment to Fort Carson, and I wanted to talk a little bit about that. You may wonder why a Secretary of State is talking about transportation. And that's because before assuming that office, I was the vice chairman of the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, these are the approximately $180 million in projects that have been built directly to benefit Fort Carson. Uh, the overwhelming majority of these transportation dollars are not federal in nature. They are instead state and local. And it's important to note that these don't just represent a bureaucrat's decision or a government's decision, both the state funds and the local funds were a direct result of ballot issues passed by the people of the state of Colorado and the people of the Pikes Peak area to support the projects that directly benefit, benefited Fort Carson. This is a list of some of those projects and you will see arrows pointing on every direction of the uh, developed sector of Fort Carson, both on the west side with Highway 115 improvements, the north side uh, with the south metro improvements that took Academy from a narrow two-lane road to a four-lane divided highway, and with the improvements directly on the interstate. And this is the difference. You will notice on the picture on the left the way it used to be at Gate 20. And while it may not be readily apparent, unless you look carefully, you will see that the long line on the road is a line of cars waiting to get in and out. <laughs> on the right, after a $60 million project, is a full movement interchange that provides direct access for the men and women who serve on Fort Carson who enter that post every day. On the north side, uh, there was a two-lane narrow road. You now see the four-plus lanes uh, that were built by a local initiative from the people of this community saying we support Fort Carson, we want this to be an important base and one that the military uh, will recognize and one that our community says we don't just say hey we get a lot from Fort Carson, it's a community that also says we are willing to give a lot to make sure that Fort Carson functions well. You should also know that Colorado has been one of the leaders in providing the right to vote to the men and women who serve in the military. This is important for our community as the men and women who serve at Fort Carson often are called upon to serve in places across the world. And we have had one of the highest rates. And in fact, while many states around the country saw a decline in military voting in the last presidential election, Colorado saw an increase in 93.6% of the military who received ballots were able to cast those ballots. That's the type of commitment our state has to ensuring their right to vote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary. Up next is uh, Dennis Heisey, the chairman of the Board of Commissioners for El Paso County, who will talk to us about encroachment. Dennis. Thank you. Gentlemen, Thank you all for your service. 
You've, uh, I've been warned to stay on script, by the way. I, I'm maybe a known quantity here, but uh, <laughs> you've, uh, you've heard a lot today uh, about how much this community supports Fort Carson. Uh, in fact, we're really just pretty protective of, of Fort Carson, and we're demonstrating that through an ongoing effort led by El Paso County to establish and expand a buffer zone to protect the critical downrange, what uh, now Secretary of uh, State Williams would call the undeveloped part of Fort Carson, the uh, downrange training facilities from the threat of residential encroachment. Residential development on property adjacent to Fort Carson on the south and east sides was a particular concern. We did our map right, north is to the top. Uh, so in 2005, El Paso County began the program in conjunction with the Army to establish a protective buff buffer zone around those areas. On the map in front of you, the dotted line running roughly north to south indicates property that's been identified as important to provide an adequate buffer zone. At the top, in blue, is a heavy industrial asphalt and concrete operation not subject to uh, residential development and never complains about anything happening over at Fort Carson. Further south is the light green is the Ray Nixon power plant. Again, no residential development. Immediately south of there is the Pikes Peak International Raceway property. Again, no threat of development happening there. But to the south, this area, this area uh, was developed, it's in the brown, was developed prior to Colorado's implementation of subdivision regulations in 1972. The county, working together with the Military Affairs Council and other community leaders, have worked to make sure that Fort Carson can maintain full use of critical battlefield training facilities and still be a good neighbor to the community. First, working with the Nature Conservancy and private landowners, Permanent conservation eas easements have been placed over this entire area in yellow. You see where it wraps around Fort Carson there. There can be no development through this entire area. Next, El Paso County has secured an agreement with developers and other landowners in the large brown area, ensuring that water rights assigned to this area will be used for development outside the buffer zone. That was a fairly creative uh, arrangement since we really are a property rights state here, property rights county, and, and the developer was, uh, was willing to come to the table and listen to, to what we had to say and agreed that we had a plan that worked well for him. Finally, in the area of the, with the lighter brown hash marks, which is of particular concern because of its proximity to Fort Carson's live fire range, El Paso County worked alongside the, the Army in a program to identify willing sellers. And through this process, the county has actually taken ownership of 28 parcels of land previously slated for residential development. These property acquisitions alone add up to nearly 1,000 acres. This is just one of the many partnerships El Paso County has, including a written community covenant signed by the cities and towns throughout El Paso County and Pueblo County. From the programs and services of our Development Human Services, Pikes Peak Workforce Center, Procurement and Technical Assistance Center, and the one-of-a-kind Army partnership that made it possible to complete the Cheyenne Mountain Shooting Complex. I, I just refer to it as the shooting range that I drive past it every day because I live down south. I am very comfortable in speaking for my colleagues in promising that we all support Fort Carson. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, next up will be Colonel Retired Bob McLaughlin. Uh, Colonel McLaughlin is now a resident of Colorado Springs, returned back here, formerly was the garrison commander. Uh, and he'll talk about uh, Pinion Canyon. Bob? Thank you, sir. Gentlemen, it's a pleasure for me to be here today. About seven years ago, I packed up my family from New England in my suburban, my wife and five children, and headed west to be the garrison commander of Fort Carson. A very proud moment, something that will be life-altering for me and my family in that position. I share that with you because it's important uh, that I give you perspective on what I learned as the commander of this uh, great garrison at Fort Carson, and I know Joel is doing it today. 
I also come to you from the perspective of a deployed soldier. I deployed from Fort Carson and had my wife and five children stay here uh, to be taken care of by this great community. And lastly, the perspective of operating at the Army level and the Director of Morale, Welfare, and Recreation, where I saw Army-wide installations. So although my comments are forged by those experience, says I'm going to talk to you about a, being a community member now. So I'm back in Colorado Springs uh, trying to work with organizations to help veterans and their families, and I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of the people standing behind me and sitting in the chairs that support Fort Carson. So my three major points are in dealing with training and Pinion Canyon and the way we're postured here in Colorado Springs. First, there's, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like the terrain that this state offers from Pinion Canyon to Colorado Springs and Fort Carson to the high altitude training and the partnership that you heard earlier. The most important thing that we do here as a community and with Fort Carson is we pay close attention to the environment and historic preservation. This is a best practice for the Army. It's what I saw when I was here and I know Joel is uh, executing it right now. And then most importantly, everything that we do here, everything that I've experienced when I worked here as a commander and now that I'm here as a civilian retiree veteran is about partnership. This community has one of the strongest partnerships with this installation that I've seen throughout the Army in the continental United States and abroad. So the terrain is very important, the terrain that everybody knows about, the high altitude training, the, the uh, good environmental concerns at Pinion Canyon. Looking to the future, how we can balance all that together is very important. I'm confident that I've been here for the last six months and seen the community working together. It's been impressive to, to watch. From working with the National Guard and Reserve, to working with the com community in the South, to working with the community here in Colorado Springs. So it's really all about balance. It's about balancing the resources of the community and watching how we work together. One of the things I'm most proud of is a institution that we stood up years ago and is still alive and strong called the Southern Colorado Working Group. It's a group that was stood up to look at across the state how we would manage training at Pinion Canyon to make sure that there was balance, to make sure that those that were opposed to training were listened to, to make sure the environment was taken care of, to make sure the historic preservation was at the top of our minds. I report to you now from what I see today, it is alive and strong, and the community backs the post, they back Fort Carson, and again, it's a best practice across the Army, dealing with stewardship of the land, training readiness, and community resources. So balancing is important. Uh, Fort Carson has been a leader across the country in looking at the balance of the environment. Fort Carson started years ago in looking at uh, resources and setting goals with water, waste, energy, transportation, training lands, air quality, and hazardous material. Training lands in, sp in specific are very, very important. Uh, what I saw and what I still continue to see is a very strong partnership that wants to maintain training lands. You heard the mayor of Trinidad speak. He said that if you fly over Pinion Canyon now, it's in better shape than ever. It's a commitment to make sure that there's sustainability in the lands and that our troops can be trained for a long time here in Colorado, both north and south. We've also been tagged as a net zero um, organization, Fort Carson and the community, setting an example for the Army with water, waste, and energy. It's another example of this community coming together and working in partnership to do the right thing, to balance training, to balance well-being, and to make sure the community is well taken care of. One of the other things that's important is working with the historic preservation. I'll tell you that uh, this is tremendously important, to balance the training lands with those who are charged to be historically correct. Uh, we started an uh, initiative with the, with the SHPO, Mr. Ed Nichols, who couldn't be here today, who's balanced in trying to make sure that we're transparent, that we're talking, that the community is satisfied, that the military is doing right by the historic preservation. And I'll tell you, in talking to him recently and reading some of his letters, I'm very proud 
as a community member how strong that partnership is. And again, it's a best practice across the Army that shows how strong this community is with Fort Carson. Uh, you heard about the nation-to-nation -nation negotiations. I was part of it years ago. Uh, Joel and General Cameron are heading it up now. It is incredibly strong with the tribes that we have in and around Pinion Canyon and how we work together to make sure that we pay proper tribute to those artifacts. These are all examples of solid partnerships that make sure that we're good together as a team, as the community, and as a organization that needs to train, fight, and win. There's been several innovations that help us across the board that work with Fort Carson. I just want to share with you briefly what I saw then and what I see now when it comes to partnerships, because I experienced this. Fort Carson stood up an organization called the Warrior Family Community Partnership that reached out to the community. I will tell you, it's as much of a give and take in the community to make sure our soldiers and their families are cared for. There's nothing like it. If you look around across the Army, this is an example-setting initiative that makes sure that the community resources are brought to bear to help soldiers and their families. You'll hear later about statewide initiatives, Colorado wants you, Colorado serves. As a veteran and someone that's trying to help vets right now, it is an incredible initiative in this state to help those in need as we downsize and transition troops out of the military. The Peak Military Care Network, which I'm a proud member of in this community, is incredible, bringing organizations together. My organization, the Mount Carmel Center of Excellence, is going to bring a brick and mortar facility outside the organization that's going to help veterans as they transition out of the military. Our relationships with the Guard and Reserve are incredibly strong in the community. I'd like to point out, and probably most importantly, is our initiative with fallen heroes and their families. The Fallen Heroes Outreach Program here in Colorado Springs and Fort Carson is exemplary across the Army. There's nothing like it. They're an incredible group working together to help that population that's well in need. So I'll tell you, it's about training and readiness, it's about partnership, and it's about a community that cares about the military. I'm proud to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Uh, what we'd like to do now is move into some quality of life enhancements, and we're going to focus here initially on education, and Cheryl Serrano, who is the superintendent of uh, Colorado Springs School District 8, thank you very much to you and your fellow superintendents who are here with you. We appreciate it. Thank you. Just correction of Fountain Fort Carson School District, but uh, I do want to recognize some of the other superintendents that are in the audience that uh, um, will, uh, I just want to make sure everyone realizes I'm speaking on behalf of the uh, 20 plus school districts in the area. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is just the positive impacts that the military community brings to our schools. And for those of us that have never served in the military, I know our teachers, our paraeducators, all feel that they are contributing to the mission by taking care of the kids. And when mission is first in the Army and all the services, we feel like we are making a huge contribution. And we are proud to serve those kids that uh, give so much with their parents being in the military. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a great environment. I'm involved nationwide in a lot of um, uh, military initiatives uh, with school districts. And even though I've never been anywhere else, this feels different when I talk to other communities and how people feel about coming here, uh, how they feel about putting their kids in, their school, in the school districts we have, the choices that we have, and you'll see here in a minute, how many choices people really do have in this community. Um, next slide, please. The, uh, the, the slide there you see is um, just the districts that have the highest percentage is what's in that first column. And of course, Fountain Fort Carson does have the highest percentage because we have all the schools that are on Fort Carson. Um, and you can see the numbers there that uh, we have almost 5,000. You can see off post are these other school districts that the majority of the Army uh, dependents do live off Fort Carson, so they're in other school districts in the community. Um, and uh, next slide, please. You can see these school districts ranging from uh, the uh, El Paso County area, 
which is, has about 22, I think. And then we've got um, down in Pueblo and Canyon City. We have p kids all over the community uh, where people are serving on Fort Carson. Um, next slide, please. The students with special needs. This, this is one of the biggest reasons people want to come here are the services that uh, are available in all of our school districts as well as uh, in the community at large for students with special needs. We are far exceed the national average in our students with special needs and it's not because the military necessarily has more students that uh, need special, uh, have special needs. They are asking to come here and we have great partnerships with uh, uh, the Army uh, and all of the agencies within the uh, community to help meet the needs of these kids. Next slide, please. Impact Aid, there's over $30 million that comes annually from Impact Aid. That's out of the Department of Education uh, to uh, local school districts. The next slide, please. The Interstate Compact for Military Children. I'm sure you're aware now all 50 states and the District of uh, Columbia are, are uh, participants of the Interstate Compact. DODIA is unable to be a member, but they are participants and uh, agreed to uh, uh, abide by the Interstate Compact basically to help kids with all the transitions they have. Colorado was one of the charter members, one of the first 11 states to uh, uh, be a part of that. And so uh, that says a lot about uh, how the community and the state at large feels about uh, having the, the supports of the military in place. Uh, the partnerships, and I, I just, when I started listing these, I thought, well, next slide, please. Where do I start? Um, because there are so many that things that we do together with, we do together with Fort Carson, um, all the school districts, just a few of these things that are in the community, adopt a school. You've heard from several people how many soldiers are volunteering in our uh, schools and other parts of the community. That's part of the adopt a school program. You'll see our soldiers in uniform and in uh, numerous schools around the community. Military life consultants, those are uh, actually placed in many of the school schools that have large military populations. Superintendent's Roundtable, the garrison hosts this uh, uh, two or three times a year to come and talk with the uh, area uh, school districts. Um, we have school-based behavior and mental health um, uh, therapy in some of our schools that the military provides to help our students. Um, our um, Army Youth Program in your neighborhood, those several of the school districts around the El Paso, around the Army Post, provide services that the students that live off post aren't receiving because they uh, can't get to the youth service, so we provide those in our schools. Um, the um, child care in our schools, the uh, uh, Fort Carson soldiers use our schools to do their PT in the morning, they're in some of our gyms, use our um, football fields, things like that, it's a great partnership. Uh, coordinated safety and security training throughout the region. Fort Carson uh, with local um, law enforcement uh, uh, communities uh, practice uh, on Fort Carson in our schools. So that's a great partnership. Um, then preschools that are funded through the state and local school districts and all of the training by, provided by the Military Child Education Coalition. Um, the um, the other thing I want to talk just briefly about is the, um, the number of choices I listed, the school districts. Colorado is also a, an extremely charter school friendly and homeschool friendly state. So parents that want those choices have those choices. We have open enrollment. So kids can go wherever they want, no matter where they live in uh, Colorado Springs. And we have thousands of students in El Paso County and Pueblo and the surrounding areas that are taking advantage of that, that option. And then uh, the school facilities, uh, how much money has been spent recently? Fountain Fort Carson in the last 10 years has spent $90 million on uh, school facilities because of the growth at Fort Carson. Um, all the surrounding areas, especially Whitefield, that have been most impacted have also had to build schools. All that money has been provided by the local communities. And I think there's one more slide that shows um, how much some of the uh, more recent projects have been. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
And now it is my pleasure to introduce Pam Shockley Zalabak, who is the Chancellor of the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Thank you very much, Chancellor, for being here. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. Colorado Springs and our region, and most importantly, including Pueblo, has an educational infrastructure in post-secondary education dedicated to supporting Fort Carson soldiers and their families through providing quality education with ease of access and multiple options. I'm here tonight also representing my colleague, Dr. Lance Bolton, who's the president of Pikes Peak Community College, who could not join us due to a family medical issue. Dr. Bolton and I work together and separately in support of Fort Carson soldiers. At Pikes Peak Community College, for example, over $1 million annually in personnel are specifically in support of Fort Carson. And recently, Pikes Peak Community College has opened an exciting almost 5,000 square feet easily accessed military and veterans program center. Additionally, Pikes Peak Community College operates education service centers at both Fort Carson and Peterson. UCCS is a regional comprehensive research institution with over 11,000 students, 12% of whom are active duty veterans or family members. We have a partnership at Fort Carson as well, and our Fort Carson Military Outreach Office, office serves active duty military from all branches of the service, as well as guard, reserve, spouses, and their dependents. In the last four years, this office alone, not counting what comes directly to campus, has certified over 500 students for in-state tuition, processed over 2,600 credit hours of TA requests, and had several thousand service member visits for direction to all types of post-secondary education. UCCS has a strong relationship with Fort Carson's transition program for service soldiers leaving Fort Carson. We regularly take an active role in supporting transition services on base and every month have soldiers coming to UCCS to talk about all types of strategies for entering college. Now, based on the subject of our hearing, I'm really not eager to expand that program because that's for soldiers leaving Fort Carson. <laughs> UCCS has been recognized nationally as a leader in supporting military and veteran students in this year alone by U.S. News and World Report, the Military Times, Military Advanced Education, and Victory Media. We provide special college orientations for military students, should they so desire. They may go, of course, to the general orientations. But we also provide workshops for faculty about issues of impact with multiple deployments and other critical issues. Those faculty workshops have been full every semester in the last two years that they have been offered. We have a Boots to Suits program for veterans, and we have mentors throughout this community who are assisting in those important times of change. We have extensive completion programs, online, weekend, and night programs tailored to active duty individuals. We have worked with numerous students on multiple deployments. Seven is our highest number for individual students to advise them on continuous progress to degree and have graduated active duty military in both Afghanistan and Iraq. We provide transfer advising when tours at Fort Carson are ending and students have not yet completed degrees, advising them based on where they will be stationed, what are the options they have in their areas. We have a current partnership called SupportNet between UCCS and Fort Carson where we are dealing with issues of behavioral health. Currently, in conjunction with Pikes Peak Community College, we are the recipients of a major foundation grant to, uh, to establish a national model for effective support of active duty military and veterans when they are pursuing educational degrees while working uh, in a full-time capacity. <laughs> but it's not just our students. Veteran faculty members and staff really are the core of most of the programs I am describing. 
we are beginning the first in the nation PhD in psychology in veterans trauma and the fir- and that is privately funded <laughs> and that first permanent faculty will be uh, a military a former military officer we consider Fort Carson a critical infrastructure for the nation and it is also as you have been hearing critical to our community But it is our community's responsibility and our responsibility at UCCS and Pikes Peak Community College to contribute to the strength of that infrastructure. We consider it an honor to support Fort Carson, and we are believing that, that we are doing that with a commitment to educational excellence and a willingness to change as times change to meet the needs of the future. Thank you for being in Colorado Springs. Thank you very much, Chancellor. Um, as you might imagine, there are many, many quality of life initiatives that we have, instig- we have instituted here in Colorado Springs and just an, an amazing number of nonprofits that exist in this community, all focused on helping service members and veterans. And the spectrum runs from the likes of a local charity like the Home Front Cares, which amongst their many contributions has provided funds in order to bring dis- distant families here to the community in support of their wounded or fallen comrades. And at the other end of the spectrum is Discover Goodwill, the national level nonprofit represented here today by their president and CEO, uh, Carla Grazier. And uh, other programs that locally, that, who have offer programs that locally benefit the military families with special need members. And in between and amongst these two great assets uh, to our community lie the many, many more nonprofits and individual volunteers giving back to our men and women who have and continue to serve. And even those who may go astray have the opportunity for the likes to uh, for veterans trauma court to provide assistance one of the first of its kind in the nation and now one of a half a dozen or so just in the state of colorado alone okay next i'd like to real quickly move to the current enhancement initiatives Uh, and we're going to begin with a rather unique organization called colorado wants you this is a statewide organization and i'd like to invite uh, major general Andy Love and Joe Blake to please step forward if you would. You'll get to speak at the end of the briefings, just like I said at the beginning of the store of the event. General Anderson, thank you very much and. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. I know at this point in the evening you will long remember what I little note, and so I will try to be as brief and and direct as possible. I'm Joe Blake. Uh, I'm the chair of Colorado Wants You, former chancellor of Colorado State University, former president of the Denver Metro Chamber. With me is General Major General Andy Love, retired, and also with me uh, th- this afternoon is Hank Brown. Hank Brown has previously been uh, introduced, a former United States Senator from Colorado, former president of Colorado University, and one of Colorado's most distinguished citizens. He's a co-chair. Also co-chairing is Dick Celeste, the former president of the Colorado College, former governor of Ohio, and former ambassador of India, appointed by President Bill Clinton. Colorado Wants You, in a nutshell, is a statewide, nonpartisan, business, nonprofit organization which is here to do everything it can to show the strength and reliance and reliability of the Colorado interest in maintaining our military assets at their highest functional level. First in line, of course, in this endeavor is Fort Carson, and we are committed to doing everything we can to be of help. You've heard throughout this afternoon the unique partnerships, the unique ways in which Colorado works together to make this 
facility the best there is. We are committed to keeping Fort Carson strong, just as we are committed to keeping our military strong as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Next, I'd like to introduce Senator Bill Cadman, who is the president of the Colorado Senator, or Senate. Thank you very much, Senator, for coming. Thank you for having me. I got to apologize a little bit. I'm having a deja vu moment. About 30 years ago, I was in the Mart Building in St. Louis. I got into an elevator with four generals. My title then was specialist. <laughs> what a difference 30 years makes. You look a lot younger to me than they did then. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Representative Carver for sharing Military Appreci Appreciation Day that we just had on Friday. A hundred legislators across the state, we took time out of what is a fairly brief legislative schedule to spend the entire morning in two houses honoring our service members, their families, those who we lost, and those who are special to us. And it wasn't just members with multi-billion dollar bases or assets in their backyards or in their districts. These were members from all across the state, Democrats and Republicans, some veterans, some not, but all showing their appreciation how important the military is to not just the communities where those bases and those facilities are housed, but to the, entire, excuse me, to the entire state of Colorado. I would suggest to you that it's not just our communities committed to Carson, it's Colorado committed to Carson and the entire military family. That's exactly what we consider them. One of our colleagues stood up and challenged us. He said, we will be measured more by the words, more by our words, by our deeds, more than the words that we share here today. And he was right. But I wanted to share with this panel what exactly that means, because Colorado can actually stand on its deeds in support of the military all across the state. Some of the legislative highlights, and I want to thank Andy Merritt for compiling this list, and I know this is part of your packets, but it's important to bring them up here, and I will just share a few of them with you. Last year, the legislative level Veterans Assistance Grant Program, National Guard Military Family Relief Fund, property tax exemption for widows and disabled veterans in 2013, in-state tuition extended to spouses of armed forces members, relief from state income tax income received from the Colorado military, hiring preferences for spouses of disabled veterans, and the list goes on and on year after year after year. I think that proves my point. It's not just the communities where these entities are housed, it's the entire state. And I think what you hear resonating here is that the members of the military and the state are part of who we are. It's part of our collective soul. General Lacamara, you mentioned soldiers fight to get here. I know what it's like to be at a geographically isolated unit or geographically separated unit. You couldn't wait to get out of there. I was in the 619th Ordnance Company in North Point. Anybody ever heard of that? Even if you've heard of it, you've never been there. And if you've been there, you don't want to go back. I have not been back for any of the reunions. You mentioned that this is not one of those places. This is the kind of place that once you get here, you hope you can stay here. People start questioning those two-year rotations. And I can say that I was in Garmisch. That was pretty good. <laughs> we hope, I think, a collective theme here to show that obviously not just what the military is to us, but what we are to the military. Hopefully soon there will be a report that analyzes some more qualitative and quantitative opportunities of quality of life, military retention, continuing education, military community support, workforce support, family support systems, job education markets for spouses and other dependents, and retirement community, which brings economies of scale to the DOD facilities. All these things hopefully will be articulated in that report, which should be prepared soon. 
And I want to quote something that uh, General Anderson said while we were working on that in last year's legislative session. We want to put the good news back there in the Pentagon as to what it is Colorado has out here. And we've got a great story to tell. And I think you're hearing that today. I hope you will take that story back. As a matter of fact, I'm sure you will take that story back to the Pentagon. Let me just finish by saying this is not about removing dollars from our pockets. It's about removing members of our families. And keeping Fort Carson strong means keeping our entire community strong, frankly, keeping Colorado strong. And we are committed to that. Colorado is committed to Carson. Hua. Hua. Thank you very much, Senator. Now I'd like to welcome Jerry Forte, CEO of Colorado Springs Utilities. Welcome, Jerry. Thank you. I'm holding in my hand right now a glass of pure Rocky Mountain snow melt. Yeah. And this is water that we've been delivering to Fort Carson since its inception. And right now we're delivering this two gallons for about a penny. It's an amazing value, and we're really pleased to be able to do that. So. I want to, um, first of all, welcome you all to our great community, and I really do thank you for being willing to listen to us all this evening. I need to start out with a personal story. I grew up in Colorado Springs uh, as part of a military family, and I remember when I was 11 years old, my father had the opportunity, I should, I'll say opportunity, to serve in Vietnam. And I remember being called into a room my dad's saying to me, Jerry, you're now the man in the family. I need you to take care of your mother. I need you to take care of your sisters in case anything happens to me. And I remember watching the car that came and picked him up, went down the road, turned to the left, and he went out of sight. And I wondered, as an 11-year-old boy, would I ever see my father again alive? So what we're talking about today is very, very personal and very, very real to me and to everybody in this room and everybody in this community. Colorado Springs Utilities is fully engaged in supporting the mission, the great mission of Fort Carson. Colorado Springs Utilities has been here for over 125 years. We were here before Fort Carson was Fort Carson, when it was Camp Carson. And we've been partnering with Fort Carson through every step of the journey over these many years now. Our organization supports Fort Carson by very competitive rates. In fact, our rates are lower than the average of military installations around the nation and the world. And what does that mean? It means more money for mission. And that's really important to us to maintain and to keep those rates as low as possible. We have four services that are under one umbrella. That means cutting through red tape, one point of contact, for, for your mission, for your base, instead of lots of different people that you have to coordinate with whenever there's an issue that might come up. We have a, a, the highest reliability in the entire nation. In fact, we were just um, selected as number one in business customer satisfaction among utilities. And that affects and impacts Fort Carson in a very positive way. Known for local, hometown type of service, not a stiff, impersonal, type of a corporate environment, maybe in another state, but right here at home, partnering with those men and women that are serving our community and really serving the world. Um, we have a record of very close partnership with your goals, whether they're mission specific, net zero challenges, helping the post to receive very favorable Western Area Power Administration hydro power and those rates, um, rebates for water, fixture replacements, irrigation controllers, lighting retrofits. We're proud that Fort Carson won the 2014 Secretary of the Army Energy and Water Management Award. We've also partnered with Fort Carson on solar projects, a woody biomass pilot program, renewable energy certificate purchases, which means solar panels at Fort Carson that Colorado Springs Utilities is able to partner on and be a part of, helping you achieve your goals of net zero. Long-term water availability and supply is critical to the mission of Fort Carson, and it's really critical to our entire region. That's why we're engaged in a billion-dollar project 
to bring water up to Colorado Springs that will secure the future for the next 50 plus years, not only for Fort Carson, but for growth of Fort Carson, for this great community that supports Fort Carson. Water is an issue that we have resolved and are in the process of continuing to do so. Fort Carson's personnel are integral to all of our planning efforts. They sit on our committees, whether it's energy, electricity, water, infrastructure, long-term planning. We're joined, in essence, at the hip in a real partnership. And that's a word that you've heard a lot this afternoon and evening, the word partnership. It's really more than a relationship. It's more than a business um, agreement. It's partnering. And that's how we view Fort Carson. We at Colorado Springs Utilities have one dedicated account manager to serve Fort Carson. So you have a single point of contact for all those different initiatives. You don't have to guess where you need to go for any of those things. But for me and really for our organization, it's much, much, much more personal than all of that. When a soldier's deployed, we work with the soldier. We work with their families if there's any kind of an issue that might arise. We send our employees into the schools, your, your children's schools, to partner for water education, for safety education, and other programs. We collaborate with the USO of the Rockies to provide winter coats and socks for wounded warriors. Our employee volunteers dedicated over 700 hours of their own time to build two pavilions in the Turkey Creek Recreational Area for the use of Fort Carson families. We've been recognized as a 2015 military-friendly employer, but really, for me at least, the most important recognition that we've recently received has been winning the Secretary of Defense Freedom Award, which is the nation's highest award in honor in recognition of employers that support the National Guard and support the Reserve. There was only five large... Yeah. Thanks. There are only five large businesses in the nation that received this award, and we were very honored and privileged to be one of them. But what it speaks of is all the veterans, all the guard, all those that are our own employees, we take care of them. We take care of them when they're deployed. We take care of their families when they're gone, because I personally know what that's like. And we support your mission, and we support the men and women that support that mission as well. So Fort Carson is much more to us than a, just a large employer in this region. It's personal. It's personal with me. It's personal with us. We're committed to serving the men and women that have laid everything on the line so that we can enjoy the benefits of living in this amazing region of the country and really the world. So our commitment is rock solid. It's unwavering, and I'd ask you to join all of us in keeping Fort Carson strong. Thanks. Thanks very much, Jerry. Next, I'd like to introduce Kate Hatton, uh, who will talk to us about the Peak Military Care Network. It's a unique program that's doing a great service for this community. So, Kate, please. But first, I just wanted to assure you that Jerry's father did come home from Vietnam. So, um, And you've heard today, thank you for the opportunity, thank you for the time uh, to be here and really talking about the Peak Military Care Network, which sort of ties together a bow all of the partnerships that you've heard about today. Our mission is really connecting need to resource, and it's really kind of a total systems approach. Next slide. I can make this quick. Do you want me to do it? Okay. Where do I? Right hand, the right button. Too far. Okay. Uh, really, when I talk about tools, total solutions, I'm talking about from leadership to boots on the ground and across systems. I'm going to really talk literally a little bit about kind of the across systems and the issue areas, from advocacy, which might be financial assistance, to um, connecting folks to the resource exchange. As uh, Cheryl Serrano talked about children with special needs, the community resources that support children with special needs and how they work and how they connect to the exceptional family member program. Early care and education through CPCD, which is our Head Start program that has a Head Start facility on Fort Carson. It may be the only one in the nation or one of the only that provides, again, resources to soldiers and their families on the installation and in the community. They're served throughout the community. Uh, across the board, 
Pikes Peak Community College and UCCS are partner agencies. The Workforce Center and the work that's done around spouse employment uh, and how we can connect folks and make sure that the community through the Regional Business Alliance and others understand um, at what a military spouse or what a veteran provides to the businesses in this community. Medical health, behavior health, social services, and again, all of those family supports, transition and reintegration programs that Colonel McLaughlin talked about, Project Sanctuary that provides uh, retreats for families returning from deployment. And again, just really across the board, all those things are interconnected. And that interconnected piece is how we really work together and that collaboration we've built. Again, there are many, many, many support programs in this community. We have formal partnerships with 25 of those very large organizations that were, you know, some of them, many of whom are here today. Again, UCCS, Pikes Peak Community College. Pikes Peak Workforce Center, El Paso County Department of Human Services, Pikes Peak United Way, and the list goes on. Really working together and they're focused on collaboration and understanding military and, and veteran culture. Uh, working with Army 101, the program that Fort Carson brought to the community to make sure that people understand what's going on with Fort Carson families. Whether that's deployments, whether that is just what it's like to be a military family that's moved to a community without family supports. And how can this community provide some family supports? And how somebody who who might be going back to college or is a, a child of a deployed service member, what that means and how that family needs to support needs the support and how that community does that. But really, again, very much in partnership with Fort Carson and through the trainings and the different things that we do. And again, the leadership, and this is really important because we want to make sure that we engage Fort Carson leadership, the other military installations, and how they all work together. Business and community leaders at the state level as well, too. It's not just about the Pikes Peak region, but really how do we connect at the state level through Colorado SERS, which was mentioned, Colorado Wants You, and the different programs that are provided throughout the state. And that we're we're linking those. We're really that dot connector, or sometimes they call us cat herders, a little of the all of the above. Service providers, those ones who really need to know and understand what family members go through, what service members go through, so that we can do a better job of serving them. And really so that the community is aligned. What can the military installations, what can Fort Carson do and not do, and how does the community need to be better positioned to provide those resources that can't be provided by the military installations so this community is fully what we really call that sort of, that force multiplier for, uh, for the military installations. And consumers are an important part, those family members and, and service service members and military spouses, if all those services that we're trying to provide and the partnerships we're trying to put together, if they don't have input into whether that's helping or working for them, it won't work at all. So making sure that we're really doing that across the board, across this community, across services, and across the state. And how we do that kind of on the boots on the ground level is really information and assistance through a website that is accessible to any, anywhere, people who are deployed, people who are moving here from other communities, people who have resources here so that we can connect them. Not only do we provide information about local resources, but people want to know what's available on Fort Carson, their resource guide. They can access it through our website, whatever works for them. And call in assistance in partnership with the Pikes Peak United Way, their 211 service. And really, we have the uniqueness about that is that there is somebody at United Way trained through the Peak Military Care Network who understands military issues and can ask questions about, you know, what's your, are you active duty, are you reserved, what's your discharge status if that's an issue, so that we can really streamline the access so that people know here's, you know, Army Emergency Relief, a relief might be a program for you or the Exceptional Family Member Program so that people aren't frustrated and lost, that they don't know where to find resources and don't know where they're able to go, that this community can streamline those resources and know what resources are available in the military, in the community, and again, make those connections as straightforward as possible. And um, you don't have to really listen to me or hear what I have to say about that because one of your own has said this before, Colonel McLaughlin, who was up here before, talked about those community partnerships. This is a community like no other. Of all the resources that are provided and the family support that is provided, um, I think Colonel McLaughlin said it best and others said it well today. Really, ultimately what that comes to is this community provides peace of mind for soldiers and their families so that soldiers can focus on their mission. That's what we want to make sure that we do. Have that community support so that soldiers and family members have what they need and that Fort Carson can do its job in protecting us. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kate. I'd like to invite uh, Keith King, president of the uh, Colorado Springs City Council and those members of the council here who have a special presentation. Welcome, thank you for being here. 
Council has a proclamation for you today. We'd like to join together with our mayor and give it to you. Whereas the Army at Fort Carson is a com the community's largest and oldest military partner dating back to 1942. And whereas the Pikes Peak region has embraced and supported the Army at Fort Carson and its family for decades. Whereas it has been an honor and privilege of our community to be the home of many military men and women. Whereas the future of the Army at Fort Carson should remain in Colorado Springs and the cuts to personnel would have a, that would have a devastating and detrimental uh, impact to our region should not be done to the soldiers and would, who have become woven into the fabric of our national heritage of, Colorado, of the Colorado Springs community. Therefore, we as Council of the City of Colorado Springs proclaim February 3rd, 2015 as Keep Carson Strong and reaffirm the cities of Colorado Springs pride in Fort Carson's contributions to the defense of our nation and commemorate the United States Army's years of excellence and immeasurable contributions to the nation and to the city of Colorado Springs. We stand here united with our mayor today. We have gone through a new form of governance in the last four years and it has given us an opportunity to have many discussions. And we have created a great forum for opportunity for your soldiers to learn about civics. <laughs> But one, we, we rarely get a unanimous vote, but one thing we do unanimously stand here today, united to keep Carson strong. Thank you very much for being here. Okay, thank you very much, uh, President King and the mes or other members of the City Council. Uh, before we conclude, I do want to make sure that I take uh, the effort to thank those who have helped put this on. As you can well imagine, a lot of people have done an awful lot to make something like this come together. Uh, folks from the Fort Carson, Colorado staff, the, the uh, county commission and who gave us the Centennial Hall, uh, and specifically David Rose who helped us set all of this up, the Antlers Hotel who gave us the overflow room, the uh, Regional Business Alliance, the MAC, and there is a small and but dynamic and committed team. You know who you are, and uh, they really were behind this as well. I'd, I'd give you names, but I'd miss somebody, and that would not be good. So you've heard about the substantial economic impact that would occur if we were to see a cut at Fort Carson, Colorado, to the state as well as to the region. And you've heard of all of the enhancements that have been done by the state and the region to keep Carson strong. But there is one last perspective I'd like to leave you with. It's not just about Fort Carson, and it's not just about the community and the state. It's about what Fort Carson and Colorado bring to the Army and ultimately to our nation's security. So you see on this slide that these are some of the unique elements that constitute those contributions for the Army and ultimately for national security. You won't find these anywhere else than, other than here in Colorado and specifically out at Fort Carson. Colorado, Fort Carson. Uh, next slide, please. Here is some more of what we have available. And so what you have here is that Fort Carson, Colorado, Colorado Springs, Colorado provide all of these capabilities to the Army. They provide a combat-ready division that is already high-altitude adapted and adjusted and who have trained in rugged terrain. Nowhere else in the Army does that occur. So cuts at Carson will have a much broader impact, not just on the, just on the local area here, but on the Army as well as on national security. Next slide, please. So what we'd like to leave you with is this. This is what you see when you go on to Fort Carson, the best hometown in the Army. I hope you kind of got that impression from all of the discussions we've had today. Home of America's best. Let there be no doubt about that. So we thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. That concludes the formal presentations. What we would like to do is open up the floor to the open session. General LaCamera wanted to be sure that we had let, made time for you to make your, your uh, comments to the panel. 
I would ask you, please, if you would limit your comments to three to five minutes, I will help you if I see that we're not adhering to that. Uh, but, uh, and I think we've got one that's already there, Peggy Littleton, the county commissioner from El Paso County. Peggy. Thank you. If we could get the overhead right quick, please. I wanted to let you know that uh, this September, El Paso County also passed a resolution claiming support for our U.S. military in El Paso County. Because we realize that today's military installations in Colorado are a host to a variety of units and commands that have played key roles in conflicts here and abroad and are critical to our national defense. I have the wonderful privilege and opportunity to be um, Colorado counties, all 64 of them, their representative, the Homeland Security Advisory Council up in Denver with an appointment from the governor. And I will tell you that this resolution is always being, already being considered by all 64 counties because we realize that we are the center point for the national def defense of our world and of our nation. We also wanted to just point out that in, in the resolution that El Paso County is home to Fort Carson and that we have also the other installations. But Fort Carson plays an important role here. They present a broad range of climatic and geological various, vagaries that enable the Army to train as they fight right here. So let it be known that El Paso County Commissioners pledge our full and unwavering support to military personnel and conducting the operations and that we will may remain steady, grateful, and a loyal partner to Fort Carson and the U.S. Department of Defense missions here in El Paso County. You can see the different synergies that we have in our community, not because we have one Army installation, but many military installations. Colorado Wants You is a great campaign for the state, but I will tell you, El Paso County loves you and we want you here in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Littleton. Uh, if I could ask you, please, as you come forward, would you please state your name? And if you represent an organization or somebody, if you could please tell us that. And again, three to five minutes, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, my name is uh, Bill Salzman, and I'm uh, uh, director of a, an organization called Citizens for Peace in Space, which deals with basically Air Force issues. Uh, currently, I'm involved in a campaign to stop the deployment of Gray Eagle drones to Fort Carson, and today turned in 400 petition signatures of people who have moral and legal concerns about that future deployment of a controversial weapon system. Um, my broad comment here is that I can't imagine the Pentagon listeners having to sit through 30 of these. Sort of one note booster session, um, one after another. And in this case, we do have a unique one here. We are, according to a Washington Post study, the most militarily dependent city in the country. Most people would think that would be a problem, and it is. The kind of hyper-militarism that that produces has, we have kind of a unique thing here. We have a right-wing Republican congressman who is, in fact, <clears throat> more socialist than Bernie Sanders because his whole job is to keep federal money flowing in here. So, um, some Fort Carson issues. Um, we're, we're kind of under assault from Army aviation. If you mention the term combat aviation brigade to most people, they say, oh, that's the Air Force, isn't it? But there's a big push by the Army to stay relevant, and it gets into some kind of ridiculous territory. They're adding a, a brigade here, aviation brigade, including those Gray Eagles, while they're shutting down three others. And that comes to another point that Fort Carson has some skeletons in its closet in terms of overdevelopment. A few years ago, they built a full brigade combat, brigade combat team complex for a brigade that had already been canceled. That problem has been magnified by the fact that since then, another full brigade has been shut down at the post. That's not necessarily just a local problem. That's a problem of Army waste, and that bill goes to the taxpayers. 
Um, and uh, another thing I would like to say, this state, if the Army overreaches, will push back. I think there will be other speakers that will talk about how the, the effort to greatly expand the Pinion Canyon maneuver site was thwarted by citizen action. I see something similar happening with the aviation assault. Um, I just spoke a couple days ago with the woman who is overseeing the BLM review of the proposal to greatly expand Army aviation use of our mountain skies, adding about 45 new landing zones in the mountains. We pride our mountains. We think that is a strength here. The Army, at least this study and this proposal to greatly increase use, in many cases, bringing in aviation units from other posts. She told me they had over 200 comments that had come in just in the scoping process. And they are sorting through them. It's people pushing back. You know, it's one thing to hear, you know, two and a half hours here of just kind of straight booster talk, but we have other people in this community that keep their thinking caps on. You know, think out of the box a little bit. Uh, we have a city overbalanced with military dependents, and there are downsides to that. And a lot of, I think a lot of the people who spoke here today know that. But there was, there was a script, one note, over and over, and I don't know how you learn anything from, from going to 30 places and hearing the same thing. Uh, I suspect you do consult other things. So. I hope you do that while you're here. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. And I'd ask the folks to kindly be a bit quiet. You can do it if you try. I know you can. And hello, my name is Rita Walpole Ague. And I have a dual citizenship, Irish and U.S. So I have a number of reasons for wearing the green today. <laughs> and I would like to tell you, Roger Clotier, that I was well educated by some folks from your region. A retired colonel, nurse practitioner, and her good brother, an attorney, who have gone in regarding Walter Reed and problems that are going on galore on trying to get our vets what they have been promised good health care, disability, when they are truly disabled, they cannot get on to the disability that they have every right, they've expected and they cannot get it. And so I've been asked to come today by doctors, both with the VA, dental people and pharmacists, and private physicians also. There's a national organization I've been honored to ask to come on to, even though my background's in journalism and law. I am not a doctor by any means, but they've asked me to join in with them. It's called the PSA, Physicians for Social Responsibility. And also a former magistrate friend of mine has also asked for assistance for so many of our vets. And I will begin in one second, but I will tell you that next, this coming Saturday at noon, and the press might take a little notice of this one, there will be a press conference at approximately 11.15 to 11.30 in that area, that time zone. And the actual gathering will occur, as was reported in the Gazette, at 12 noon in front of City Hall, and it is a group, a national group, called End All Poverty. And a woman from Maine who recently moved here was shocked beyond belief when she realized and got educated on how very, very poorly we help the poor here in Colorado Springs. And one out of three people trying to exist, living on the streets, is, guess what, fellows, a vet. 
And we, ha we are extremely concerned, many of us are, about our claims for being such a phenomenal city. My father was born in Pueblo. I well know Colorado. <laughs> and we have problems on top of problems. And so this national organization of End All Poverty is taking note of problems here precisely in Colorado Springs, many of the, these problems involving our vets and their families. And so there are many, many good people getting involved and will be there and hopefully some good people will be speaking at the press conference this coming. And you'll get a press release, fellas, <laughs> I promise you. But no, to start off with, the vets here are, are in so need of real true real McCoy health, especially those with mental health problems and post-traumatic stress disorders. A doc from the hospital in, at the VA called me a couple of years ago and things have not improved since then. And I'll go to my grave remembering his comment. This isn't practicing medicine. I have heard that repeatedly from others in the medical field. And the physicians for social responsibility are also concerned with the fact that we do so much chemtrailing here in Colorado Springs and geoengineering. Evidently, we could be some type of a research spot. And many of the upping in all of our upper respiratory problems evidently are connected with geoengineering. Okay. Veterans Today, you might look up online, has an article, The Sky Does Not Lie. And there's also a website called Geoengineering Watch. And the doctors, physicians across the country are beginning to open up more and more, even though many of us have been threatened because this is classified information. <laughs> Talk about transparency. But we certainly don't want the vets to be here and be injured by chemicals, including coal. We have our Drake Power Plant is a bit notorious for all of the coal that just blows into the <laughs> atmosphere here. So I guess I just will close with saying that we need a lot of help here in Colorado Springs. And many of us, including myself, have been asked repeatedly to raise Irish hell for those that cannot raise it for themselves well. And that's exactly what I'm doing right now. If it means cutting back on size of Fort Carson so that more funds can go into what is needed. And a finishing point, my magistrate friend has bopped in and out of court repeatedly for the vets whose money they have been deemed to be disabled and their money is being held in a conservatorship by a number of banks, one included in Denver, and he has to go into court repeatedly to get the vets their own money. Thank you, ma'am. Mother McCree. <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. Since this is my home, I'm going to help out because we don't have a clock or a timer down here. So I'm going to go ahead and just set a three-minute timer right up here so that our audience can see it as they come down. Okay. Yes, sir. Please. Um, my name is Thomas Michael Noonan, and I served in the U.S. Coast Guard as a boarding officer in the War on Drugs. My father was a highly decorated Vietnam veteran. My uncle, who I'm named after, died in a Marine Corps uniform in a, in a, a traffic, I mean, a, a, a plane accident. And I, I'm a little disappointed here that, you know, we the people, as the Constitution says, have a right to freedom of speech, but we the citizens have three minutes to say what we would like to say after wading through all these presentations. Um, Colorado Springs is a beautiful place. After I got out of the military myself, I came back here. My father retired here. And despite all these programs, and they are good programs that have been mentioned, Colorado Springs, or excuse me, El Paso County, leads the state in suicide. And part of that is veterans. And the ability to get appointments at the VA 
and the ability to get transportation there. We have one hour bus service. Buses run once an hour to get to the VA is a bit appalling to me as a veteran. The other thing is, as has been stated previously, the money going to defense or the military, as you, whatever you want to call it, somebody talked about Eisenhower, and Eisenhower on his grave, despite all the things he said during his lifetime, has a quote about the military industrial complex stealing from the poor. And I believe that is the case here in Colorado Springs and elsewhere. I have a daughter who went to three schools here in Colorado Springs that closed due to lack of funds. If a democracy is to survive, we have to have an educated uh, population. And so I really uh, appreciate that the woman from UCCS said they're going to have a PhD program in trauma. What I would appreciate even more is that our troops don't have to do multiple tours and we can prevent the trauma from occurring in the first place. Thank you for your time. And, sir, I would advise you, you do have an option and an opportunity for additional comments. There are written sheets up there. If you'd like to submit them, you can use the websites and so on and so forth. So please take advantage of that if you feel comfortable. Yes, sir. My name is Doug Holdreed. I, uh, I live in the region of influence of, of Pinion Canyon in Trinidad. And in spite of Mayor Riorda's proclamation that he is the mayor of Los Angeles County, I'm sure that you suspect that there is more diversity of opinion uh, around Pinion Canyon than, than perhaps uh, his position might, might reflect. Um, and I suspect there's more diversity in El Paso County than the pres presenters at this meeting um, might lead you to uh, suspect. But I know that you know that. And I, I thank you for your patience in, uh, in, in sitting through all of this. I'm actually a, a Coast Guard veteran also. <laughs> I'm not sure what, what that means, but I, uh, I think it's good that you're here. I think it's important that you hear people's stories and see people's faces and that decision, decisions aren't just made on the basis of numbers on spreadsheets. So um, thank you for that. And, and I just want to... Um, urge you, and I know you are, looking beyond just these orchestrated presentations and, and appreciating that there's uh, more diversity to it than that. My own story uh, began when I came to this, uh, to, to southeastern Colorado as a young man uh, just out of the Coast Guard as a volunteer with the Mennonite uh, Voluntary Service. Uh, that was back in, in 1971. Um, I've, I've been in that part of the country, I, I taught for 30 years at Trinidad State Junior College uh, as an art professor. And uh, after I got here, one of the things that I discovered were the canyons. And so I took long, solitary walks through the canyons. And I discovered all of the prehistoric and historic stuff there. I, I discovered the graves of uh, people like Kit Carson, who Fort Carson's named after, and all of this rich heritage that's in southeastern Colorado. And I fell in love with the place, and it kind of became the subject matter for my artwork. And then in the early 80s, the Army came along and asked us in Los Angeles County to make a big sacrifice. They, they explained to us that they needed our land in Los Angeles County uh, to train for tank warfare against the Soviet Union, which at that time you know, was something that um, people were concerned about. So through our legislative process, we al allowed the Army to use 200 and, well, at that time it was more than it is now, but, but now 237,000 acres of productive agricultural land. It was a big sacrifice for Los Angeles County. I mean, if you want to talk economics and the impact of federal actions on, eco on economics, Los Animas County suffered greatly from uh, the loss of, of that uh, agricultural land. The Cold War ended, and, um, but our sacrifices were still needed. They were needed to sustain Fort Carson, and they were needed to bolster uh, the economy of Colorado Springs. We've never accepted down in Los Angeles County that, that Pinion Canyon is the armies to do with as they please forevermore. 
When the federal government took that land away from private owners, it became the property of the American people. It became our property, and we've let the Army use it for over three decades now. It's a pretty long time. At the time that the Army took the land, it was on track to become a national natural landmark. It represents uh, a big loss to us, a big sacrifice. 3,000 head of cattle were, were grazing on that land, and in today's prices, that's like about $3 million worth of, of beef. Um, there are heritage sites, 4,000 archaeological sites on Pinion Canyon that could be cultural heritage tourism assets for us. Uh, the natural beauty is something that is an economic factor for us. So we have hopes of someday getting that land back and doing something else with it. And basically the bottom line is that if there's a troop reduction at Fort Carson, that, m that might protect the land. It might preserve it so that we could get it back in good condition so that it, it can be uh, returned to the people, returned to the people of southeastern Colorado in the future. So again, thank you for coming and seeing our faces and listening to our stories and, and, and realizing that there's uh, a diversity of opinion. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Hello, gentlemen. Thank you for your time and for allowing me to speak before you. Uh, my name is Scott Olson. I'm the executive director of Pikes Peak Justice and Peace Commission. That's a nonprofit that's been in Colorado Springs for 30 years. We were started by the Catholic Archdiocese up in Denver to promote peace and justice. Justice meaning helping those less fortunate. Uh, we do a tour called Urban Experience here in Colorado Spring where we take citizens from the community around to see, walk the path of the homeless and find out the services that they uh, are available for them, uh, encourage them to get more involved. Many members from our community uh, work with the homeless. They also work with the military. We have many members that uh, served in the military. So we're really about peace and justice. Some people think, oh, if we're about peace and justice, we're against the military. No, we support the military. We believe that we know human nature does have an aggressive nature, but we also have an altruistic nature. It's perfectly fine to be able to defend yourself. We have peace camp in the summer where we teach young children, grades first through eighth, nonviolent resolution skills to be able to resolve a conflict or an aggressive act by another child in a positive way. So the reason I'm talking to you is I, I think I would like to see the military, specifically in Fort Carson, emphasize peace more than just the war aspect. Perhaps a peace division, perhaps a department of peace. If you don't want to cut the military, cut the, the personnel, why don't you add uh, an area where you can have them go out and work with these other countries, these other organizations that we're having such difficulty with in nonviolent resolution. Try to come to some kind of agreement. Listen, this is a finite planet. Wars are erupting everywhere now. It's getting sort of out of control. I think really all the people in the military would prefer to be at peace. Our world wants to be at peace now. It is possible. You don't want your soldiers in harm's way. I understand that. So let's do what we can to bring more peaceful resolution. Why don't we build roller coasters rather than war machines? You know, why don't we encourage people from other countries to see beautiful Colorado Springs, to see the Colorado, uh, visit their countries? I'll say last, last year we gave a, a peace scholarship to a young woman who's family was in the military. Uh, she attended Fort Carson. So we are certainly in favor of peace. We just like to diminish this war aspect. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, sir. 
gentlemen. My name is Bill Becker. I'm with Security Service Federal Credit Union. We're the credit union on post at Fort Carson. And I'm a proud alum of the Colorado Army National Guard. I wanted to take this moment in this unusual sequence of, of speakers to communicate something of our employees' sense of appreciation for the work that we're able to do on post with the men and women that are stationed there in particular. We have 19 locations up and down the front range, but this focus that we share on, on Fort Carson, we find ourselves very involved in programs such as the Survivor Outreach Services. We work with the Community Partnership for Child Development, the Head Start program, and many of our employees volunteer in things like Homes for Our Troops construction, uh, honor flights in both northern and southern Colorado. And what I wanted to be able to convey in just a few moments is the sense of appreciation for our employees to be able to serve and contribute to an aspect of the mission that isn't out front but relates to the, the health and welfare of the troops. That's primary to us. And I appreciate the opportunity to just let you know that there is a cadre of the common folk throughout all of Colorado, and in my travels, I, I'm all over the state, that really appreciate all that goes on from the standpoint of the service of our men and women in the military, and we thank you. Thank you, Bill. Just a reminder for those that went longer than three minutes, as was so uh, stated earlier, you're welcome to go get back in line and come down again. This is just so that everybody's voice can be heard at least once. Hello. Thank you guys for being here. My name's Stanley White. Um, there will be no fluff and there will be no uh, anything like that in my speech here. And I'd like to start off, uh, Colonel Hamilton can back me up on this, uh, in setting the tone of what's going on, really going on at Pinion Canyon. Uh, the last meeting I was to in Pinion Canyon, there were two armed guards, uh, uh, civilian guards there, and there was some discussion amongst the crowd as to who they were there to protect. And it was, we, were, we came to the deduction that they were not there to protect us. They were there to protect the military. And that, that's kind of the tone of things at, at the Pinion Canyon meetings. Uh, you can be sure that this is a fact. Colonel Hamilton can back me up on that. I just have a little bit to read here. My family has ranched in Los Animas County since 1937. I'm currently operating on land that's been in my family since that time. Major General Wes Clark, uh, I was on the screen here earlier, was quoted recently in an, in an article pertaining to this meeting, and, and this is part of his quote. There are a lot of people in that area who don't want the military presence. I think we all need to share a little bit in this thing we call national defense and understand they have just as much at stake in this as the military does. The first part of this statement is true. I'd like to list a few of the reasons for this, first, PCMS was created mostly through the largest act of condemnation in American history. During, number two, during this process, we were repeatedly lied to, and, it, and that continues today. There are hundreds of examples of this. There's no question expansion plans for PCMS are alive and well. To speak to that, I'd like to say an analysis of alternative study dated in May, of, May 6th of 2004 by the Army concluded that PCMS had a maneuver area shortfall, area shortfall and recommend the acquisition of additional training land adjacent to the PCMS. If you're not familiar with that, you will be soon, I'm sure. Um, since that time that I just described, there had been a great deal of increase in the activity at the PCMS. We believe and know that this is an overload to uh, require expansion of the boundaries of PCMS. There, there was many years there we've had a, a funding ban on that within or without. Now that's been taken away from us by a politician and, and uh, so they're expanding in within without question, and we know the outcome of that. Anybody here doesn't, doesn't understand that, just give it a little time. It'll come to you. 
In, our, in an Army PowerPoint presentation, the Army concluded that to achieve full sustainability, a PCMS allows 4.4 months of maneuvering per year at the PCMS. We're, we're describing a whole lot more of that now. It just, it just, it's, the facts are skewed to fit whatever needs to be done. I will end very quickly. Oh, back to the, back to the Major General stuff. Our share that he was talking about in this deal, we need to share in this thing. Our share is giving up everything we've worked our entire lives for as the expansion marches on. And our stake is whether or not a federal marshal will step up on our porch and give us 30 days notice. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Al. Good evening, gentlemen. My name's Al Beatty. I'm a local businessman, but I'm not here to talk about that this evening. I serve on three uh, local boards, two of which give back to the military community. I, we've heard earlier that this community in this area is home to hundreds of nonprofits that serve our active duty and also those that have prior, have prior service. I'd ask the audience here in the room, it's time for a stretch break. If you've served in the military or are now, please stand up. Thank you for your service. Hey, back in uh, 2003, as we were having two brigades, an ACR and a brigade, come back from their first tour in Iraq, this community wanted to do something a little different, maybe a little different than some of our left coast uh, uh, fellow states, uh, and do things different from how soldiers were treated when they came back from the Vietnam War. This community had some leaders go visit with Fort Carson leadership, and was given the okay to start welcoming home soldiers. We started that in October of uh, 2003. We put that program on uh, mothballs in December of 14. During that time, we welcomed home nearly 200,000 American heroes who had protected our freedoms over the years, and we welcomed them with a handshake thanks for a job well done, and gave them a sand-free quarter pounder with cheese and a soda with everything in English on the cans. Many in this room served in that effort. It was a community effort, and it didn't quit after one year. It lasted through the end of last year. The Army brought me here back in 1979. Like a lot of people, uh, geez, I jumped with joy when I saw those orders uh, bringing me to Fort Carson. And then I found a way to stay here. Happened to marry someone who uh, retired from the military. And, and like a lot in this audience, supporting the military is part of our fabric, part of our DNA. My oldest son last year got back from serving in uh, Afghanistan. So I, like many of those in the audience, we support what Fort Carson does for this community and for its state. And our actions speak louder than our words. This community has done many things to support the soldiers, uh, not only while they're on active duty, but assisting them when they get off active duty. Thanks uh, for all you do uh, protecting our freedoms, and thanks for all of you for being here this evening. Thank you, Al. Yes, sir. Thank you. My name is Doug Nelson. I am a Navy veteran. My late wife was also a Navy veteran. We have a son who's in the Navy now. He's flying off a carrier somewhere off the East Coast. The thing is, I didn't come here with facts and figures or the ecology. I came here with some truths for you. If we have to go to war, you don't win a war until your combat infantry soldier walks into enemy headquarters with his rifle and tells him to line up and move out. You know this. That soldier may come from here. We here in this community cherish that soldier and the thousands of comrades that come with that soldier. We do not look upon Fort Carson as a neighbor and we do not look upon Fort Carson as a cash cow. We look upon Fort Carson as a sentry. 
Right down the road is the Cheyenne Mountain Air Station. There is where the satellites and the best surveillance equipment in the world keep this country safe by keeping us alert. Fort Carson guards that station. And right up the road is the Air Force Academy, where some of our very best and brightest young people come here to learn how to fly and, if necessary, operate the equipment that will put the fear of God in any adversary. If we have a physical threat, units from Fort Carson can be there not in days or hours, but in a matter of minutes. You provide physical security. And right over there is Peterson Air Force Base. It's a major transportation hub for the Air Force. And right out there is a world-class command and control center. And just like the fire department, Fort Carson can be there in a matter of minutes. Please understand, it's not a question of economics or the ecology. We need you. I thank you for your time, and I hope you hear me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for um, being here. Um, this last week, the Wall Street Journal uh, reported that the um, <clears throat> federal civil servants have grown by 7 percent, while the uh, trigger pullers have declined by 8 percent. According to my calculations, we have 15% um, too many paper pushers for the current force structure, especially in D.C. I used to work a short distance from the White House and lived in the greater D.C. area and know the D.C. environment and culture. My reason for supporting Fort Carson for the fake, uh, sake of the families is that many areas in Colorado Springs are safer for women and children than you'll find in middle class neighborhoods and the greater D.C. area. Moms can actually let their kids walk alone to school without fear. Many of the areas of Colorado Spring have a better culture to raise children than the deviant and decadent culture of the greater D.C. area. Many more of the residents of Colorado Springs like, value, appreciate, and honor members of the armed, Uniformed Armed Services, unlike the greater D.C. area, where many disdain and show contempt for them including some staffers on the Hill. My reason for supporting Fort Carson for the sakes of the lives, limbs, and sanity of the members of the armed forces are, for centuries, true leaders have known that you have to train as you will fight, and you have to condition troops as closely as possible to the climate and terrain they'll fight in. With the cost of living adjustment uh, for stationing troops outside of the greater D.C. area, we save much more money than we could and provide them with the new equipment and more training. We had two feet troops to fight in Afghanistan and Iraq. As a result, we had stop loss orders. And during our recent wars, we had a very steep learning curve, and we had too few mid-level officers due to cuts by Clintons and the Democrats. One of the questions is, do Democrats care more about federal civil servants than they do about the lives and limbs of service members? During the American revolutions, Indians met up with the British to attack the rebels. Looking at the assembled forces, the Indian chief said, why are we here? If we're to die, we're too many. If we were to win, we're too few. In my calculation, if we've uh, reduced by one third our brigade combat teams, we ought to reduce by one third the federal civil servants uh, starting first in DC and uh, replace those Brigade combat teams have been reduced. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time to be in here. I'm, my name is Kristen Carlson. I'm a Colorado Springs native. I am not a part of a military family, but I have been surrounded by a lot of military families, whether if it's grandparents, aunts, uncles, or even very close friends. You've all heard the businesses explain why it's important to keep these additional troops here. Well, part of it is, unfortunately, a few years ago, we had the Waldo Canyon fire. They were our support, as well as to the Colorado Springs, as well as Teller, as well as to other firefighters and the other members of the community and the state. 
They were able to provide additional firefighters, aviation, engineers, but not only that, they were able to provide the training that they actually have when they are trying to um, fight the fires that when they're at combat or at other installations. With that, all that experience from that fire, they were able to per show unfortunately to the next summer when we had Black Forest, as well as the um, down further south and the other fires within the state, how to fight these fires and what use, um, resources to use. With that, that actually helped us. And with that, it also showed the community who does not have a lot of experience with the military, what they do. We saw it on TV, we saw it in social media. We, all just, we could have had the opportunity to see it firsthand. I think that is a great opportunity for not only the individuals who have lived here, but also for the future individuals, young and old, who want to move here. That's very important, that is our future. And by taking that away, that is kind of, you're taking away part of our education, our community education. With that as well, they also get support, as many individuals have said during this presentation, from beginning to end. For those individuals who want to enlist into the Army or who are able to be an officer in the Army, all the way to, as many individuals say, to retire here. When I travel, people say you're from, when I tell them I'm from Color Springs, they're like, oh yeah, Fort Carson, Air Force. Oh yeah, my grandfather has retired there. They love it. They love coming here. That's important to everyone. That's important to our community and everything. Also, all the education, me personally, through high school, through my college years, either I've dated or had very good friends in the military, I got to go to the base and I got to see these missions. I got to see hands on how they maneuver during their training. And even in Panyon Canyon, they talk about like, oh, it's horrible to have it. I've been there. I was there through the YMCA, but I also got to see how some of these missions worked. And it was very valuable because I know them what they're doing overseas, how they're fighting our um, wars. And unfortunately, as everyone says, Colorado Springs is the center because unfortunately we have all these military bases, but it's not a bad thing. It's a great thing because one, as a civilian, I know I'm protected. I know I feel safe. I know I'm safe on the ground and in the air. And it's a very wonderful thing. And I, to end with that, I would like to say that Colorado Springs is supporting um, Fort Carson, but we are strong. We have always been strong through the years, and I've watched it get stronger as growing up within this city. And part of that, with that Colorado Springs strong, we want to continue to keep Fort Carson from being always Army strong. So please consider to keep these troops here. It's very important to us. Thank you for your time, and hopefully you don't have to hear to too many more presentations. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Gentlemen, thank you for the opportunity to comment. My name is Gina Gare. I'm a native of southeastern Colorado. I work for an organization called Not One More Acre based in Trinidad, Colorado. For four and a half years during the 1980s, my family lived day to day not knowing if we would be the next ranch condemned for the establishment of Pinion Canyon. During those four and a half years, <clears throat> We watched neighbors condemned. We watched neighbors carted away by federal marshals at a time when you know more than any others there was no national security threat to our country that the existing military infrastructure could not handle. I'm here to present a recommendation for the future Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site, a separate military installation from Fort Carson, Colorado. This future is one not nearly so dependent on decisions made in Washington, D.C. and on uncertain federal funds from the Department of Defense. This more stable and sustainable future will better, feel, will better serve the region's residents mm -hmm. and our environment. Mm -hmm. It will make use of the region's natural resources, but will not degrade them. In so doing, it will attract long-term investment in family agriculture, business, and ecological research. This future would benefit our region's people directly, not enrich the lifestyles of government contractors based elsewhere in the United States. It would offer a sustainable future for families 
who would grow the economy without degrading the air, soil, and water, or damaging wildlife and natural areas. It would include land, pra pra land management practices to prevent the return of Dust Bowl-like conditions. Our region is already affected by long-term drought, and our lands are federal, are, are very fragile. Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site is located directly south of the Comanche National Grasslands. National Grasslands came into the system as recovery units from the Dust Bowl. Throughout a federal lawsuit that not one more acre brought, bought, brought and then in over 30 NEPA documents and comments since, the, the the, since the court threw out the PCMS transformation EIS mm -hmm. in 2009, not one more acre and its members have documented DOD's tragic and irreparable destruction on our land, air, lives, and livelihoods only to face unrelenting intensification of military operations at Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site. Ten months after the federal court threw out the transformation EIS at Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site, then Garrison Commander Colonel McLaughlin let loose War Horse Rampage 1, a destructive uh, in unprecedented ways, destructive maneuver without a valid environmental impact statement in violation of the National Environmental Policy Act and the environmental policy laws of our country and citizen engagement in the federal judiciary of this country. Ma'am, could we please ask you to wrap it up? The Colorado Springs Business Alliance hosting this event today called the six-year-old funding ban that the citizens of southeastern Colorado won, preventing any spending on any aspect of expansion at Pinion Canyon, destructive and, a destructive and dangerous piece of legislation, and then endorsed Congressman Cory Gardner for Senate for his role in killing that funding ban. When citizens engage the nation's institutions of democracy, the judiciary, the legislative branches, and the executive branches of our government to defend and uphold our nation's values and laws, our victories should neither be ignored nor violated. It must stop. We are asking you to close Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site. We need to restore stability and sustainability to our lives, and I will leave you with a question. Has our fight for a more stable and sustainable future in southeastern Colorado just begun? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Evening, gentlemen. My name is Brian Strongreen, former military myself in the Army. Um, just kind of making this up as I go along. I was moved to speak by some of the negativity here. thought it was important to let you know that there are civilians who do support keeping Carson strong. Uh, it wasn't just a dog and pony show put on by the city itself. Um, the reason I'm speaking to you is I've seen some of the impact that the force reduction can have. My last duty station was overseas at NATO Command Headquarters in Brunson and working in the Shinin Mine area. Uh, which Shinnan is one of the closures that is now occurring because of the reduction in size. Uh, aside from the economic impact in that, one of the things that sticks to me is I speak to a lot of the Dutch friends and Dutch neighbors I made over there that I left in Holland, and what they said to me is when my, one of the things that stuck to me, my neighbor looks down the block where all the military families used to live with her in the local economy. She says it's sad because she feels like she's lost her family. We were very ingratiated with the Dutch community. Um, and, you know, I feel like the same thing. Having left there, I was so ingratiated with the community, it's like I lost family. It wasn't just that I was losing a duty station or losing friends. Um, I've served at Fort Bragg, 
Sir Fort Sill, Fort Polk, um, you know, Fayetteville, Lawton, all those areas. I never felt like part of the community. You never felt supported. Uh, part of the reason I left the military was I was going to go back to Fort Bragg, and I wanted no part of being in Fayetteville. The uh, reason I came to Colorado Springs is because of the community here, because of Fort Carson, because of the support structure for veterans, because of the respect for veterans and citizens. Uh, firsthand, myself, I've experienced nothing but support as a veteran uh, for my friends that are serving here as soldiers. The community backs it. The base provides so much support structure. Uh, personally, when I was dealing with issues with the slum war and I was facing eviction and homelessness, I found nothing but support in the community for, through veterans organizations, through resources that are provided by Fort Carson. Uh, I feel, again, even as a veteran, that I'm part of a family here in the Springs. Not that I'm just a citizen of Fayetteville, not that I'm a citizen of Los I'm part of a family here, I'm not just a citizen. And I think a lot of our soldiers feel the same way. And just seeing the impact of losing a couple of 100 soldiers from the Shinnin base, and what that did just for the morale and just for the sense of family that was built in that community, to multiply that number by, take that from 100 to 1,500, 3,000, you know, 16,000, Taking that out of community is not just having the economic impact. It's a morale issue. You're taking away family from people. You're taking away from the soul of the community. So it's important you keep those soldiers here and you keep Carson strong. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Daryl Wass. I am the chairman-elect for the Pikes Peak Association of Realtors. We're an organization of just over 2,800 members, many of whom are retired military. Just wanted to say thank you for your service to our nation. Thank you for your supervision of our troops. And also just to thank you for the partnership that we've had with Fort Carson. For over 20 years, we have had a volunteer realtor program at Fort Carson to assist the soldiers as they're coming in that are needing off-base housing. Whether they purchase a home, rent a home, that's been an integral part of our organization. I remember when I became a realtor 15 years ago, it took me a while to get on that list to be able to volunteer. So we really appreciate that relationship. Uh, Mr. Martin here has been uh, taking care of that for a long time. Terry Storm, our CEO, is a uh, former military. And the number of people that we have in the military in our organization, former military, spouses of active duty military, is staggering. Uh, when the government shutdown happened several months ago, our town shut down. You saw the impact that was had in our economics. I hadn't seen that since 9-11. You guys are very integral to our economy. And uh, happy wife, happy life. I have no better customer than a soldier that comes here that finally managed to get here. A soldier and their family, they're thrilled to be here. I'm pretty much guessing that a happy soldier equals an effective soldier. So uh, we'd love to have you stay, and we'd also gladly welcome any others that you need to move here because of other bases that are shut down or are decreasing. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. As a uh, Coast Guard dependent for over 20 years and with a father who retired from the Coast Guard and came to Colorado Springs, there are a significant number of Coast Guardsmen that support our military and came here because of the support of the military community. I'm Jim Martin. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you for a couple of seconds uh, this afternoon, this evening. I too am prior service Coast Guard, just like uh, Terry, but I had hoped that there would be someone from ACS, Army Community Services at Fort Carson to be here this uh, evening to talk about maybe some of the services that they provide. And in conjunction with that is the volunteer realtor program that I started, uh, I believe it was in July 25th, 1994. So this coming July will be 21 years in effect, only the second post in the United States to have a volunteer realtor program, as Daryl talked about, to uh, help transition soldiers, their families into our community. And once again, we're here to support you and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Hello. I know you've been here a long time. I'll be brief. I'm Mike Waters. I'm another one of those uh, uh, retired military that chose to come back here to, to uh, Colorado Springs. 
And I uh, want to just uh, mention, along with uh, UCCS and Pikes Peak Community College, I now work for uh, Colorado Technical University, and we have a long list of um, uh, military accolades. Nearly uh, one third of our uh, our student population is military affiliated. We have a long uh, history of a relationship with Fort Carson. We want to, uh, you know, continue to serve that. But one of the things that uh, that drew me to Colorado Technical University, and one of the things that uh, I like to to, to to let people know about is our Wounded Warrior Scholarship Program. We offer, offer 50 full-ride scholarships every year. Now, it's a national program. We offer 25 to active duty, 25 to spouses, but it's a full-ride scholarship. And so we try to really put our money where our mouth is. And, and we, uh, with our main campus here in Colorado Springs, uh, we, we tell uh, Fort Carson a lot about that because uh, we want to keep Carson strong. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good evening, gentlemen. My name is Wanda Abramson, and I want to thank you for being here today, and also thank you for your service. Um, because of your service and the service of the young men and women at places like Fort Carson, um, we have the right and the freedom to stand up here and give our opinion no matter what it is, and we appreciate that so much. Um, I would have never come to Colorado if it hadn't been for Fort Carson, because when I was eight years old, in fourth grade, my father was stationed here, and um, he... I've lived here my whole life. Um, I, my father um, passed away years ago, uh, but he served in Vietnam a couple of times. My brother, who went into the Marines, um, still proudly um, displays his flag and the medals that he received for his service. I have um, nephews who you know, have served in the military. Um, both of my daughters, um, I have two girls, and both of them fell in love with and have married Fort Carson soldiers. And one is now, um, has discharged from the military and is um, attending school in the GI Bill at UCCS, um, but has given me a beautiful 18-month-old grandbaby, so I love him to death. And my other daughter is about to see what military life is really about, um, because her husband is about to be deployed, I'm sorry, on the 18th of this month. So Fort Carson, it's so important. Fort Carson is important to our community as an employer and as a partner, but Fort Carson is family. And we love Fort Carson. And we just appreciate everything that they do for our community. And I hope and pray with all my heart that we can keep Fort Carson strong here in Colorado Springs. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. My name is Jacqueline Skinner. I'm a DOD civilian that works out of Fort Carson in behavior health. Um, it's unfortunate that we have to meet like this to make decisions to cut. Um, our soldiers need us more than anything, um, especially in behavior health. We just opened up our sixth clinic of behavior health at Fort Carson. Um, I'm military. I've been around the military my whole life. I've seen this happen before where Congress gets together and says we need to cut. Fort Carson is not one of those spaces that should be cut. We have a lot of work left to do with our soldiers and with our veterans that are, that are also living here. Um, it would be really unfortunate for them to lose Fort Carson, as well as myself being a DOD civilian. Um, there's a lot of things at stake there when you start talking about cuts and you, people's lives are in stake because of it. So please reconsider uh, the cutting of Fort Carson. We need that. We need your support as well as Congress and anybody else who cares to listen that we need this and we need to keep it the way it is. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Tom. Gentlemen, thank you for your service and for those people under you. I'm uh, from Manitou Springs, which provides some low-cost housing, as does Pueblo, for uh, a lot of the enlisted uh, soldiers uh, that are stationed at Fort Carson. Uh, I, my father was World War II Navy. My uh, father-in-law <coughs> was a uh, Navy pilot, uh, gold, uh, gold Star. And uh, I got out of the Air Force 50 years ago, got back, back in the United States. I was so pleased to come back to this community 
And I've been very fortunate to have been involved both in uh, Aurora, Denver, Colorado Springs, and Pueblo uh, with veterans or organizations. And I had the honor and privilege to work for uh, a Medal of Honor recipient from Pueblo and a, a prisoner of war from uh, Vietnam. Uh, but what we learned from my dealings with working with a lot of nonprofits to support the military was the character that your men and women brought to our school systems and to our community. And the, in my opinion, the, the way the country's headed, I think it's entirely in the wrong direction. I hope that these young men and women that come back from Afghanistan and Iraq will provide the leadership that we need in Congress that been there and they'll understand how important it is that your work continues. And given the current situation and the world situation, I think Fort Carson is very definitely needed to remain strong as a training base. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hey there. Um, my name is Caroline O'Brien, and my husband's a soldier at Fort Carson. Um, and uh, I just want to say thanks for getting him home from Afghanistan. That's pretty super. Um, we're actually out here. I'm from D.C. <laughs> So I uh, hope you don't have too horrible traffic when you get back. But um, yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here if it weren't for four cars. And we built our forever home here, and we're we're pretty happy here. And uh, yeah, that's it. Go destroyers. So. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. I'm a 24 year retired Army veteran. And I never was fortunate enough to be stationed here. Both of my sons have. Uh, since I I retired in 91, so I've been in the area for quite some time. I've seen F Fort Carson grow from uh, not much more than a camp to a state-of-the-art military base. Uh, the government has spent millions of dollars in recent years uh, putting in new housing, <laughs> barracks, motor pools, aviation assets, you name it. Uh, it would be a shame not to utilize those assets uh, based on where we're at the, with the training abilities here with the high altitude training, Pinion Canyon, uh, and the Air Force. Uh, it would be insane not to use what's already been placed here. Uh, I was stationed in many places I would not care to go back to based on uh, the base being remote, uh, the people of the town surrounding not being very friendly towards military. That's not true here. Uh, everybody supports Fort Carson. And I think we need to use, if we need to cut, there needs to be cut somewhere else. Sending guys on combat tours three and four time turnarounds is unnecessary, and it's not fair to them. One combat tour is more than enough for anybody. And so if we need to cut, it's not cutting troops. There's other ways that can be done. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Don. Gentlemen, my name's Don Knight. I'm with Colorado Springs City Council. And uh, just for my credentials, middle generation, three generations of military. My dad retired Army First Sergeant. My wife and I were Air Force. My two daughters were Army. Oldest was Airborne. Her husband's a Ranger. They went downrange twice. My son was a Marine, went into Fallujah twice, fortunately after all uh, the combat. Um, I want to talk about a different area of a growing mission for the military and also show how it's not only about what Colorado feels about Fort Carson, it's what Fort Carson brings to Colorado. And that growing mission is defense support to civilian authorities. I have not heard it touched on tonight. It was mentioned earlier about our Waldo Canyon fire. That happened in the summer of 2012. At that time, it ended up being the largest, most devastating fire in the history of the state of Colorado, destroying nearly 350 homes. That quickly turned into a type one incident 
and so got ran by the National Forest Service. And in all this bureaucracy, we as citizens here in town watched for three days as the smoke grew and the C-130s that are MAFs qualified for fighting forest fires sat on the ramp at Peterson until the Forest Service and their portion of resources finally activated them and brought them against the fire. Fast forward a year later, we had the Black Forest Fire. That fire remained a Type 2 and under the control of El Paso County. Because of a pre-arranged agreement between our Paso County Commissioners, Dennis Heisey, Peggy Littleton, or a couple of them, and Fort Carson, between the MOA we had, we had Fort Carson helicopters with Bambi buckets attacking that fire within 24 hours. The respect that that got for the Army with inside the citizens of Colorado Springs is uncalculatable. And that's why we enjoy having them here in our backyard. Thank you. Thank you, Don. <laughs> yes, sir. Get the mic down to where a short guy can talk in it. Uh, thank all of you for your service. And uh, my father was a uh, in World War II, and when the uh, Vietnam War came around, I tried joining and ended up being a 4F. So what you see in front of you is a, a flunk that was physical, but I still try to participate and help out the uh, citizens of the area. Uh, so thank you for your service sincerely. I appreciate that. Uh, I come from, uh, I guess back up just a minute here, is that obviously from all the conversation and comments made today, uh, I think the conclusion is that we can come up is that uh, Fort Carson is critical to El Paso County and the economy of the area and the protection of the uh, United States across the world. And we're free because of our military, and I really appreciate that. Uh, reality, I want to talk about where I come from, is the economy of Otero County, which is just north of Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site. Our economy is not military. Our economy is agriculture. And we have uh, the second largest ag or the second largest uh, uh, cattle sales barns in the country that's there. And as you heard earlier, the previous, uh, for me, previous speakers is that uh, Pinion Canyon Maneuver Site took a lot of economy out of our area, now not in the volume of dollars that you see in metro area because we're a small area. Otero County has uh, 18,600 citizens total. So when you take uh, uh, and affect the economy down here, it doesn't take as much to have a dramatic impact on our economy. Uh, what's happening at this particular point is that we have ranchers that are raising cattle, and we have farmers in the area. And with our economy being totally on ag-based area, what I would like to see is better communications. Of, you know, in my opinion, Pinion Canyon is owned, or not owned, but controlled or whatever by the military, by the Army. Um, I've had multiple times of being able to talk with uh, Colonel Hamilton. Thank you for being here. And... Uh, you know, the ev it's evident that the land is there. It's going to need to be used. There's several areas of concern that I have. Number one is we need to look at the fragileness of the land to see if the, what we're proposing actions is going to be able to be sustained by that use of the land. Second is that the impact of the military operations has a direct impact on our, uh, I got to take care of, uh, it has a direct impact on our um, uh, ability to raise our cattle, our cattle operations. We've had several instances where low-flying aircraft comes across at certain times when the ranchers are working cattle. Cattle get scattered all over the country, all over the countryside, and they spend another day or two trying to collect the cattle. Uh, branding operations. There's several key times in the area that, is, that impacts our ability to have our revenue stream 
kept intact by keeping our cattle and our ranching operations intact. And so what I would like to ask, you know, the EIS to me down in that area feels like it's a one-way conversation. This is what I want to do. We make comments. It's put in the back of the book, and that's the end of it. I, 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 what I would like to see happen is two-way communications where the military talks to the neighbors that's there and says, when is your branding operations take place so we can schedule operations around that and we can coexist instead of scattering the cattle during certain times of the year. The other activities could come into play is how do we work together to mitigate those damages. It could be, as an example, that the uh, corrals used to uh, accumulate the cattle and work the cattle is uh, could be moved to a different location and be in less impact with that. What's wrong with talking to them about that and helping with that operation of moving those corrals and moving things around a little bit to help out in that area? So, I, so what I'm asking for is is your actions on how you use that land has a direct impact on Otero County and Los Animas County's. Uh, economy, because there's no direct money spent down there or very little that we can see. When I look at my budget for the county, it's all based upon uh, ag-based environment. And so help us out. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I might be the last speaker here tonight. I'm sure a lot of people will be thankful for that. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your service and the opportunity for this community to present to you. I actually have a pretty unique connection to Fort Carson because not only am I a Colorado Springs native, I'm a Fort Carson native. I was born at Fort Carson in 1960. Both my parents were in the Air Force at Ent Air Force Station, which is now the Olympic Training Center. Uh, but 1960, I am an old guy, uh, there was no hospital at Air Force Academy and we had to go down to Fort Carson. Uh, but I do come from a military family. My uh, uh, D brother Doug is a retired Navy SEAL, just retired in March of this year. And I'm here to come at you from the business community standpoint and really to help you sell or help this community sell to you. The reason why Fort Carson and Colorado Springs is so unique in this country, when you look at the number of bases that are located here, the Air Force, the Army, we actually have some, a couple of Navy installations I'm aware of. Uh, but from my standpoint as a business development guy, and I've had a company here since 1994 when I brought my family back from my tour of duty in California. I spent my early career doing startup companies and financing and developing technology, and that's what I do here in Colorado Springs. And I've had the real good fortune of working with a number of veterans who've come through my Colorado Springs Entrepreneurs Group who want to learn how to start businesses after they retire from the military. But during this last probably 20 years in Colorado Springs, I've had the great fortune of serving on the Pikes Peak Area County Government's Community Advisory Committee. I was a chairman for a while. Had the great pleasure of meeting Kate Hatton, who put together that Pikes Peak Military Care Network. I saw it from its early genesis come to come to fruition. I've had the privilege of meeting with and communicating with and helping a number of business people in this town work with veterans. We've got a brand new National Veteran Village Alliance that's being formed here in Colorado Springs. That's following up the Rocky Mountain Veteran Foundation, which is actually an outreach group that's putting housing together for veterans. You've heard a lot of negativity in terms of some of the services that are not being provided to the military by the military infrastructure. Yeah, we get that. But this community has tools and assets and resources and a holistic environment that you will not see anywhere else in the country. I am convinced that you might spend the next 16 visits going to these other bases around the country and you are not gonna find a group of people citizens, military organizations, nonprofit organizations, anywhere in the country that can match what this community does for the Fort Carson community. And I really wanted to just come up last, hopefully, to sell this mission to you. We really appreciate your time. We're at three and a half hours. I know this has been a long meeting, but we wanted to make sure you were leaving here on a positive up note. Thank you very much. Thank you. Terry, are you Terry? Are you last? Yes, I'm last. Okay. I'm sorry to uh, mess up his uh, thoughts. <laughs> so I want to say something that you haven't heard yet. Um, when I was in Vietnam, my wife moved here because she loved Colorado Springs, and we knew we'd come back here eventually. But I've got a good friend who was a, POW, a German POW at Fort Carson. 
during World War II. He left after the war, went back and got his wife, married his wife in uh, Germany, brought her back here because he wanted to live in Colorado Springs. He wanted to be near Fort Carson, and he knew what this community was like. So it's not only people, are retired military, but German re uh, mil military <laughs> that came back here. We all love it. He loves it. He wouldn't live anywhere else. I wouldn't live anywhere else. Thank Thanks, you. Terry. Okay, I'd like to take the opportunity, if I may, just to read an, an excerpt from uh, a piece that was provided to me by a good friend and colleague, uh, Command Sergeant Major Retired Keith Klein, which I think somewhat typifies a lot of the feelings that we have here in Colorado Springs, and it is this. Every soldier counts, and every soldier and every family member counts. Here in Colorado, we have a great appreciation for the endless ways that soldiers and their families positively affect our lives as they go about living theirs and participating in our schools and our churches and our communities in general, doing their good works and impacting all of us through their high character and selfless service to not only their nation, but also to their neighbors, whether helping to fight fires or hosting a street breakfast fundraiser, or conducting rescues in a flood, or marching miles to deliver toys to needy children, or lending a hand to their sister services in a landslide, or coaching a park and rec sports team, or in bulldozing a fire break, or delivering hay to stranded cattle in a blizzard, the list goes on and on, and we value each and every one. We'd like to offer another perspective by suggesting that the single most important thing we, the state, and the surrounding military communities can do for our soldiers is to afford them rigorous and realistic, and yes, sometimes that means loud individual and unit training opportunities, whether it be for the foot soldier or the artilleryman or the armored vehicle commander or the pilot of the helicopter or the unmanned aerial vehicle. These are the most important things we can do because when all is said and done, nothing enhances a military family's quality of life like giving their soldier the best chance of coming home from combat safely. So that concludes our session for today. Uh, we certainly thank you all very, very much. Uh, I think you've gotten a great representation of what Fort Carson means to this community and what the community means to Fort Carson. And I don't know if there's anything you'd like to add, uh, Roger? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. It's been our honor and privilege um, to listen to your voices. Um, we got a lot of notes. We got a lot of data. Um, I promise you this will all be brought back to the senior leaders. Um, I spent three years uh, in Colorado Springs. My wife worked in the community. My three kids went to school here. My youngest son was born in Colorado Springs. So I understand the relationship. And even though it's been 15 years, your voices have brought it all back to me. So I, I want to let you know, one, that your voices have been heard. Two, everything that was said here will be brought back. No decisions have, uh, have been made. And the last thing I want to say is, um, for us and the senior leaders of the Army, this is not about numbers. I can tell you personally that the Secretary and the Chief um, do not sleep very well at night because they know this is about soldiers and families and hopes and dreams and lives. Um, so everything that is, was said here and all the data we got will all be put into our report and given to the senior leaders. And they're going to make the best decisions they can uh, to support and defend America. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you all very much.